so I will begin. So, so Assistant Deputy Minister Flock, Commissioner's Representative Taker, Directors General of Sejeps and School Boards, welcome. Welcome also to the many colleagues from the Canadian and Quebec government offices, including the Ministries of Education, Ministries of Finance, uh, the Commissaire à la langue française du Québec, and from our community groups and the many levels of the education sector. On behalf of, community, uh, <laughs> on behalf of Concordia University, I thank you all for joining us on this cold November morning at the Quesgren Education and Vitality Forum 2023. Also, thanks for coming and for some who people who haven't got sick yet. Um, my name is Anna Hunt. I am Research Associate at the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, or Quesgren. I am the forum organizer and co-chair of the program, uh, forum program committee. I would first like to acknowledge that Concordia is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyakahaga Nation is recognized as the, uh, the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Montreal, Jachagi, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. And when discussing reconciliation and decolonization within the context of education, I am reminded of something that the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair, Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission stated, which is, education got us into this mess and education must get us out. Education must now play a central role in addressing the historical gaps in our knowledge of our colonial past and its modern day impact. Uh, it's essential uh, for establishing a mutually respectful relationship between Canada's indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And one such resource to help do this is Con Concordia's Indigenous Directions, which offers a plethora of research uh, resources, courses, and projects. So I, I advise you look them up. So this is the third forum organized by Quesgren on education vitality, dedicated to supporting Quebec's English language education sector. And I am proud to have been involved since our inaugural forum in 2018. And one of my main responsibilities at the first event was to manage the tech. Uh, and on that note, sorry about the registration process, guys, for this event. Uh, we did our best and you're here. So congratulations there, um, got through it. I am really happy now to have expand, expanded my mandate this year as forum organizer. And it's quite exciting actually for me. Um, a constant, however, over the years has been the needs and priorities of our education community. Our 2018 forum yielded a forum report, copies of which can be found online or also at the front desk. Um, it outlay, outlined the major themes, and also thank you, Celine Cooper, who wrote it. Uh, it outlines the major themes of uh, emerging over the three days of our, the forum activities. It's very pertinent to mention that these themes included in 2018, the decline of the K-12 school system, youth retention, a need for research, the importance of a continuum of English language education in the province, the diverse nature of our institutions, institutions, students, staff, and stakeholders, uh, and the need for policies and programming that recognizes this, and the need for institutional control, which all seem pretty relevant to me still. Um, I'm now going to speak a bit in French, so get ready. Uh, nous avons ensuite commencé à planifier notre prochain forum pour novembre 2020. Et va sans dire que nous avons dû rapidement pivot ou rédiger nos plans. Et euh, nous avons fini par organiser deux événements en ligne. Un événement d'une journée consacré aux besoins de jeunes, puis un forum régulier des trois jours en ligne régulier des trois jours en 2021. The report de ces deux événements sont également disponibles sur notre site web de Quesgrin, dans les ressources. Il est important à noter que si le virage marquant l'éducation vers le monde virtuel était bien sûr un thème prédominant euh, en 2020-2021, les thèmes qui ont émergé lors de l'événement original de 2018 pardon, continuent à prévaloir. And now we find ourselves at the 2023 edition of the Education and Vitality Forum. As you will have seen, we have a pretty stellar program uh, and it was made possible through the support and collaboration of a fantastic program committee. Brian will be naming them uh, in a few minutes. 
And I do also want to single out my forum co-chair, Celine Cooper, who is the managing director of the Consortium of English Language uh, CEGEP Colleges and Universities of Quebec. So thank you to uh, all those mentioned. Uh, and I also want to express my sincere appreciation for our many community partners. Um, and finally, I want to say a big thank you to my Quiz Green colleagues, Anna Gomez, Lorena O'Donnell, Andy Aloisio, Patrick Donovan, and Shannon Bell for all your essential support. You got me through this relatively sane. Uh, in the planning of this event, the theme of collaboration rose again and again, collaboration between institutions, communities, partners, individuals, and I believe Brian will be touching on this a bit more shortly, but if there's anything personally I can take away from the planning of this event is that everyone has something to learn from someone else uh, and knowledge cannot be created in a vacuum and, and it can stagnate when it's kept in silos. So that's something to keep in mind. As such, I look forward to us once again having this opportunity to learn about the realities and challenges faced by the different levels of the English language education continuum in Quebec, what is being done to address them, and what future actions are needed to make the education system stronger. And now I'm going to pass you over to Mr. Dr. Brian Lewis. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Anna. Merci. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Je vous remercie d'être venu à notre forum aujourd'hui et demain. It's great to be here in person, finally, with you. My name is Brian Lewis. I'm professor of communication studies here at Concordia University, co-director of Questgrin, and chair of ILET. Launched in 2009, the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, or Questgrin, is a collaborative network of researchers, stakeholders, and educational and other institutions that work to improve understanding of Quebec's English-speaking communities and promote their vitality through research, knowledge production, knowledge dissemination, and public events. At Questquin, we pride ourselves on multiple collaborative research projects. Within a research-focused organization, different opinions are often shared and diverse voices are heard. But equestrianers, we're always looking for the data. This forum is likely to reflect both the diversity of our approaches. We're looking forward to some good discussions. And we look forward to engaging in lively, respectful work over the next two days. For those of you who aren't familiar with ILET, the interlevel education table was created by Questgrin in 2017 to bring together specifically representatives of Quebec's English language educational community. We publish policy-focused research, as Anna mentioned, they're available on our website. And in our biannual fora, we bring together researchers, practitioners, community stakeholders, and policymakers to share and discuss best practices and initiatives that support our diverse communities. A key element of ILET's mission is to facilitate collaboration between stakeholders, as Anna has mentioned, and it's this theme of collaboration that emerges time and again at these biannual conferences. I want to thank Anna Hunt for her leadership. She's the co-chair of the ILET Program Foreign Committee. But the Forum Committee mem other members are another co-chair is Celine Cooper, Managing Director of the, at the Consortium of English Language SAGEPS Colleges and Universities of Quebec, Anthony Damasio, Professor of School of Education at Bishop's University, Linton Garner, President of the Quebec Federation of Home and School Associations, and council member at the West Quebec School Board. Debbie Horrocks, Director, Provincial Resource Team, CLC Network, Leading English Education and Research Network, or LEARN. Margot Legault, Executive Director of Literacy Quebec. Dominique Michaud, Director of Research Development at Concordia University. Maria Palpica, Teacher and Researcher, Director, Department of French at John Abbott College and Paul Zanazani, an Associate Professor in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill University. They worked really hard for over a year to bring together the program we'll be enjoying over the next two days. I finally want to thank warmly the Secretariat pour Relations avec Québécois d'Expression Anglaise for their support, Bill Flock, Lisa Short, the people we work with quite often, as well as the Department of Canadian Heritage, the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities, Concordia University, 
and the Consortium of English Language Sages Colleges and Universities of Quebec. A recurring theme of these forums, is, as uh, Anne has mentioned, has always been collaboration, but around these, this theme always has been bubbling the issue of institutional control. It's with great pleasure then that I introduce our first keynote speaker today, Russell Copen. He's been an important force, a voice at the heart of institutional control questions for years. The title of Mr. Copen's keynote is direct. It's the vital importance of control and management of our school system by our community. Russell Copen holds an honors Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from McGill University, and he's pursued graduate studies in public policy and public administration at Concordia University. Russell's been a part-time assistant professor at McGill's University's Max Bell School of Public Policy since 2019. From 1994 to 2008, he was a member of the Quebec National Assembly for Notre Dame de Grasse, and he was mayor of the borough of Côte Neige, Notre Dame de Grasse, and a member also of the executive committee of the city of Montreal from 2013 to 2017. Mr. Copeman has been involved in and sat on the boards of many community organizations. In September 2018, he was named executive director of the Quebec English School Boards Association, where needless to say, he's been at the center of the action. Russell Copeman a été depuis longtemps une personne au cœur des enjeux principaux dont nous discuterons lors de cet événement. Nous sommes ravis qu'il ait accepté de prononcer le discours d'ouverture de l'édition 2023 de notre forum sur l'éducation et la vitalité. Before Russell takes the mic, I have to return the mic to Anna, who will explain something called CIDO, CIDO, excuse me, which is the way, which is going to moderate apparently, uh, the way we're going to do our, our question period after the talk. So Anna will explain that. Thank you, Brian. And I just thought of something before I do slide, I also want to say thank you to Dr. Richard Schmidt, who's in the audience today, who introduced me to Cresgren at the very start of uh, my career with Cresgren. So thank you, Richard. Uh, he was also my internship supervisor. Uh, okay, so today for the questions, we're going to be using this uh, tool called Slido, which uh, will allow people to ask, pose the questions using either smartphone or any technical device connected to the internet. There's a QR code. They're big on QR codes now. Um, or you can go to slider.com and it will, ask you, it will ask you for a code, which is there. The questions will come up on the screen eventually uh, once we start letting them up. Um, but when you start posing, when you go uh, to this address, it will show you the questions people are asking. Um, and, uh, you know, it, if there's a question that, particularly interests you, um, like it, I hate all this jargon, but you can like the questions, uh, and that will indicate the questions that the most amount of people are interested in, and this is what uh, a tool which will, we uh, like to try different kind of interaction uh, things like Cresgren, and we hope it will make the question and answer period more efficient, because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Um, I'm going to pass you back to, well, I'll pass you to Russell now, Mr. Copeman to come and do his talk, and thank you all again. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Merci beaucoup. Those of you who know me know that I often speak um, extemporaneously or from skeleton notes. But on this occasion, I thought that I'd better have a full text of my remarks. So uh, here goes. Good morning, bonjour. Uh, once upon a time, I used to say bon matin, but the fine folks at the Office Québécoise de la Langue Française have told us that bon matin is an anglicism and is not recommended to be used in French. And uh, so I reverted to bonjour, and sometimes, of course, say bonjour, hi, as well, just to sort of round it out. As I uh, look out at this uh, majestic scenery, I can't help but be inspired. The Canadian Rockies are, I believe, as impressive as the Alps, and the Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity is certainly, hold on a second, that's the wrong speech, okay. I'm sorry about that. 
It's what happens with technology and paper. You know, you can you can get uh, mixed up occasionally. Let's try that again, shall we? So, I, I guess that really didn't didn't work. A eh? note to self: that's that. Uh, <laughs> thought it might work. I wasn't sure. It, it did work. Okay. I just need to know for next time if there is a next time at whatever occasion whether that works or not. Yes, I saw that the band center is looking for a new director. It's a. <laughs> almost as interesting as being president of Concordia University, I think. Um, so uh, my colleague, Cindy Finn, who's director general of the Lester B. Pearson School Board. Good morning, uh, director general John McMahon of uh, Vanier College. Um, uh, Sylvia Martin LaForge, who's the ex uh, director general of the Quebec Community Groups Network. Uh, Assistant Deputy Minister Flock. And I see uh, Charles Taker of the uh, uh, Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply honored and a bit intimidated to be delivering this keynote address to the Questgren Education and Vitality Forum. On aurait, puisque ce forum de deux jours en est une d'une importance capitale pour la communauté anglophone du Québec en matière d'éducation et vitalité. Le programme consiste de sessions impressionnantes sur une variété de sujets d'actualité livrés par des éducateurs, des chercheurs, et des membres, des membres influents de notre communauté. Et je suis réellement honoré de faire partie de cette conférence. And I'm a bit intimidated because I'm neither an academic nor a researcher, but I do have some experience with public policy, both as a practitioner and as a contributor. A keynote speaker should, in my view, try to do three things. One, be heard by the audience. Very basic, very important. Two, try not to be boring, not always successful. And three, be informative and or thought provoking. I find it amazing, for example, that many speakers wander away from the microphone and uh, <laughs> as a result can't be heard. This is not helpful unless you want your audience to take a nap. Secondly, a little bit of well-placed levity can also be a good tool particularly if the humor is self-deprecating. For example, a line such as, and I'm sure you've heard this line, uh, as many of us have. In the late 70s and 80s, many of the best and brightest young English-speaking Quebecers left the province for Toronto and points west, leaving me. So that line can be both telling and a bit amusing. The informative or thoughtful part is always a bit more challenging, but I'm going to try. Um, I've been given now just under 30 minutes uh, for this uh, keynote address. A bit of a challenge. Uh, in the National Assembly, we, have, we usually talk in blocks of 20 minutes. Their maximum uh, speech was 20 minutes. For English-speaking members of the National Assembly, it was pretty easy. We only needed about 10 minutes of content, because we do 10 minutes in French and then 10 minutes in English. So I have the challenge of trying to give you 30 minutes of content, uh, full, full, a full 30 minutes of content. A quick word on the organization I have the honor of uh, working for, the school boards in Quebec, many you may not know this, actually predate Confederation. And the Quebec English School Boards Association has existed under various uh, names since 1929. The QESBA is, as its name suggests, an association of the nine English school boards in Quebec. Our boards have some 100,000 students, which is roughly 10% of the total uh, enrollment of the province, and administer over 330 schools and centers in every administrative region of Quebec, with the, ex with the exception of the Grand Nord. There are English schools in Timiskaming in the west, Franklin near the US border in the south, Shefferville in the north, and home of Charles Taker, the Magdalen Islands in the, uh, in the east, in the Gaspé. Because there are only nine English school boards in the entire province compared to 61 French language school service centers, some of our boards are geographically huge. For example, the Central Quebec School Board covers a territory roughly the size of Spain. The Eastern Shore School Board covers a territory roughly the size of Belgium, but on both uh, shores of the St. Lawrence River, the Gaspé and the North Shore. 
As an aside, it's interesting to note that school boards are really the last public institutions exclusively controlled by and for, or as francophones outside Quebec put it, par et pour the English speaking community. Many of our schools are quite small, some under 100 students from kindergarten to grade six, and are located at huge distance one from another. These geographic and demographic realities are important factors in the organization of English language education services in Quebec and are tied to the need for our community to manage and control our school system. So why does the QESBA and many others in our community, by the way, believe that the control and management of our school system is so vital to our community? Firstly, to state the obvious, a healthy, thriving quality education system is crucial to any society. However, research has shown that this is particularly true of minority language communities. Without schools, minority language communities cannot thrive. These schools are not only transmitters of knowledge and values, but are often vital community centers. Because we've had an English language school system, relatively robust, more robust prior to 1976, but robust nonetheless, since before Confederation, we often overlook this fact, this, this crucial fact about the importance of schools. But Francophone Canadians outside Quebec who are fighting to retain their language and culture understand this very, very well. Okay, so the existence of an English language school system is perhaps a given. Perhaps not. Some people say we don't need two different school systems, should all be one. We can have that discussion if you'd like uh, later. I happen to believe, as do my colleagues, that we, we need two systems. But why one under the control and management of our community? The answers, in my view, go to the need for a certain degree of autonomy and recognition that uniformity, du mur à mur, run by a central authority, namely the Department of Education, and by extension, the majority community, is not always in the best interest of minority communities. This is generally true in broader society, which is why we have charters of rights and freedoms in both Quebec and Canada to protect the rights of minorities, with the Canadian version, of course, being enshrined in our constitution. Depuis plus de quatre ans maintenant, nous avons eu de multiples exemples de décisions prises, soit par le gouvernement du Québec ou par l'Assemblée nationale, le Parlement du Québec, qui vont, selon moi, à l'encontre des intérêts de notre communauté. Vous les connaissez aussi bien que moi, mais voici quelques exemples. The adoption of Bill 21. Quebec Secularism Law, which prevents school boards from hiring teachers and administrators who wear religious symbols. In the view of the QESBA, this prohibition runs counter to the benefits of having a diverse teaching staff and to the values of tolerance and inclusion that we hold dear. The adoption of Bill 40, which abolishes school boards and transforms them into school service centers. And I'll speak more on this uh, later. The cancellation of the, a much needed investment in Dawson College to provide adequate facilities for its students. And I remind you, this was not an expansion of Dawson College. It was an investment to bring Dawson College up to the, the, the space norms that are recommended by the Ministry of Education. The improvised changes to the Charter of the French Language brought about by Bill 96, especially at the CEGEP level. And I know you'll be having a town hall discussion about these challenges tomorrow afternoon with John McMahon and his colleagues. The outrageous changes to university tuition fees for out of province Canadian students, which will hurt all of Quebec, but particularly McGill and Concordia, and which pose an existential threat to the existence of Bishop's University, which I suspect later, if I read the program correctly, will be addressed by Principal Le Belgrenier of, uh, of Bishop's. 
So I haven't even attempted to be amusing for some time. So now here goes. This is how I often feel when contemplating this, these issues that I have just enumerated. Or one or the other. When one adds to this fact that the, that the English education system only makes up 10% of the education sector and has particular realities and needs, is it a wonder that things don't always go our way? I understand there'll be a session this afternoon where the changing realities in Quebec's English language elementary and secondary sector will be discussed. So let's circle back to the vital importance of control and management of our school system by our community. Firstly, it's worth highlighting that minority official language communities in Canada have a constitutional right to control and manage our education networks by virtue of Section 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the resulting jurisprudence that has developed over the past 40 some years. Reading the wording of Section 23 does not give you or anyone, frankly, the full extent of that jurisprudence. You have to look at the numerous court cases right up to the Supreme Court of Canada that really give you a, a better understanding of what those control and management rights are. I remember when Bill 40 was introduced and we started talking about, uh, about Section 23, the then Minister of Education said, well, there's nothing in Section 23 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and, and, and Freedoms about, uh, about school boards. Those, that name is not even mentioned. Well, that's true. I had to remind Mr. Roberge that that charter is dated from 1982. And since then, there's been a whole series of jurisprudential decisions that really specify what, what those rights are. You, you can't go back only to section 23 of the Canadian Charter, which by the way, just talks about really access to English language schools. You also have a session on educational rights and group vitality, vitality after lunch today, which is likely to expand on this subject. And I will sit in on that subject and make sure that Stephen Thompson of QCGN gets it right. He will, I read his paper, he got it right. I'm just, just teasing Stephen. Just, teasing. Okay. just let me point out that Canadian courts right up to the Supreme Court of Canada have issued judgments that reflect a generous, broad, purposeful and remedial definition of our control and management rights. Most recently, Justice Sylvain Lucier of the Quebec Superior Court struck down broad sections of Bill 40 as unconstitutional in the case brought by the QESBA and all English, all nine English school boards. So why does our community need control and management? <laughs> There's a little delayed laugh there, I don't know who that. Was that you, Charles? <laughs> Charles got the Shakespeare reference right away, so I don't know why that was delayed. It's, it's... I'd like to divide this next part into two sections, pedagogy and values and attachment. Let me regale you with some interesting pedagogical facts relating to our English language school system. The English Education Network is very proud of the fact that 86.8% .8 of our our, our student success rate at 86.8%, as measured by the seven-year graduation rate from high school used by the Ministère de l'Éducation du Québec, surpasses by a full five percentage points the overall Quebec average of 81.8. Looking only at the public education system, the Quebec average seven-year high school graduation rate is 78.6%. Six of the nine English school boards, that is to say two thirds of them, surpass this average. Regionally, six of nine of the nine English school boards surpass all the school service centers located in their regions in terms of the seven year high school graduation rate. Five English school boards are among the top 10 school service centers and school boards combined in terms of the seven year high school graduation rate. The top 10 in Quebec, five of them are school boards. 
This is quite remarkable considering that there are only nine English school boards compared to 61 school service centers in Quebec. Finally, three English school boards, including the board of the director general who's seated, seated not far from me, have a seven-year high school graduation rate above 90%, a success rate unrivaled by any school service center in the province. That 90% graduation rate, by the way, after seven years, is the Ministère de l'Education du Québec's objective for Quebec in their new five-year strategic plan. So three of our school boards are already there. Now, there's always room for improvement. No one will deny that. And I suspect even Director General Finn would say, look, that 90%, I'd, I'd like to get it higher. That's what good educators and pedagogues would want to do. No one in our network is sitting on these laurels. But generally speaking, the English language education network outperforms the Quebec average in terms of student success. Now, what accounts for this? Well, there is perhaps surprisingly no clear evidence-based answer. In fact, I saw a clip where the current education minister, Bernard Drainville, was asked this question. He says, why is the success rate higher, generally speaking, in our English network? And he said, I haven't the foggiest idea, which is at least candid. Minister Drainville is nothing but candid. But, you know, maybe his department should be looking at why we have those rates rather than trying to fix something that isn't broken. Or worse, dismantle something that is working well. So I think we can point to a number of factors. English school boards have been using distance learning and distance tutorial support exclusively, extensively for more than 10 years, particularly for more specialized courses in sparsely populated areas. We have a generally cooperative relationship with our unions. There are far fewer grievances proportionally in the English sector than in the French sector. We tend to have greater parental and community involvement in our schools. And we have a history of innovation and flexibility. For example, French immersion was developed some 50 years ago by the South Shore Ro Pro Regional Protestant School Board not the Department of Education, in response to demand from parents for better French second language instruction. Regarding French second language ac acquisition, which will also be the subject of one of your, of your sessions, although our boards have generally excelled in the teaching of French, many parents are preoccup preoccupied with whether our programs will allow their children to work and thrive in, in today's Quebec. A further challenge is the additional French language requirements that CEGEP brought in by Bill 96. Je suis un produit de l'immersion française du Protestant School Board of Greater Montreal. Mes enfants également à la Commission scolaire English Montreal. Du temps où nos étudiants en immersion française écrivaient les preuves ministérielles de langue maternelle française, secondaire 4, Nos, nos étudiants l'écrivaient au secondaire 5, mais c'est l'épreuve ministérielle de langue maternelle française. Ils réussissaient mieux l'examen que les élèves dans les écoles publiques de langue française. As our graduates of French immersion or French intensive programs, are our graduate of French immersion or French intensive programs as fluent in French as if they had attended French schools? Generally not. But do they have the foundation to thrive in Quebec? I believe they do, as the experience of my three children can attest. My middle child, shouldn't call him a child anymore, he's 34 years old, uh, went through French immersion at, uh, at um, Willingdon and uh, Royal West schools, went to uh, Dawson, uh, did a bachelor's degree here at Concordia and a master's degree in French at the Université de Montréal. So that gives you some idea that although not completely fluent, not perfectly bilingual, I believe that our children get that necessary foundation. They have to work at it, 
Sometimes you, you need to do more in the workplace, but the, the foundation is there. A reflection is needed on the appropriateness of the current offer of French second language instruction in English schools. Of one thing, however, I'm, con I'm convinced. This reflection and any actions that may stem from it will be best undertaken by our community and our school boards, not by the Ministère de l'Éducation du Québec. Turning back to the Constitution, the landmark 1990 Supreme Court of Canada, Maé versus Alberta case, set the legal foundation for minority community control and management rights. In Maé, Chief Justice Brian Dixon, writing for the court, wrote, wrote, don't point it there, note to self, don't point it at the screen, point it at the computer. The minority language representatives should have exclusive authority to make decisions relating to the minority language instruction and facilities, including, and you see five categories there, expenditures of funds, appointment, and direction of those responsible for the administration of such institutions. And I'll circle back to that a little later. Establishment of programs of instruction. The exclusive authority of representatives of the minority language community. Recruitment and assignment of teachers, and I'll circle back to that. And making of arrangements for education services for minority language students. We see how these five exclusive authorities have an, we will see how these five exclusive authorities have an impact on the various challenges we face a minority community. But regarding pedagogy, it is clear that constitutionally, in relation to language and culture, because the courts attach these exclusive authorities to the notion of language and culture, it would appear as though we don't have a constitutional right, for example, to teach math differently in our schools, because that doesn't relate to language and culture. But certainly, as it relates to language and culture, our community has, through its school boards, a preponderant role to play in the development of and the teaching of curriculum in our schools. At the very least, this applies to French second language, history, and certainly to the new Quebec culture and citizenship course in development, which will become part of the basic school curriculum next school year and which I believe, ladies and gentlemen, needs to be looked at very closely by our school boards. Of course, part of pedagogy is the accessibility to English language education for those who are eligible to receive it. School boards understand the vital importance of doing everything possible to keep, to keep schools open. Many of the small schools in our network are not from a purely budgetary standpoint particularly viable. But I put more faith in elected community representatives, namely the Council of Commissioners, to be as responsive as possible to the needs of the community than I do in the educational bureaucracy in Quebec City or the Quebec Treasury Board. The other area I want to talk about in relation to control and management of our school system by our community is values and attachment. Some of the examples I'm going to present to you are symbolic, but symbolism can be an important factor in attachment and in the tr transmission of values. Bill 40, which transformed school boards into school service centers, has ushered in a period of much greater centralization and uniformization or standardization that we have seen in education in many years. Here are a couple of visual examples. So this is, these are logos. French service centers have a strict requirement on what they can use, the font they can use, what they can display. So you'll see here, it's handy that you're here, Cindy, I must say, I picked less to be Pearson. No, I know it's not planned. And frankly, I'm glad you're here because I can't explain yours, but perhaps you can. But, but, it's, but I guess my point, ladies and gentlemen, is it's different, right? It represents something. And I'm sure Cindy will be able to tell you what it represents. The Centre de Service Scolaire de Montréal, it's the standard Quebec, government of Quebec logo. The Ministère de l'Education, I show it next to you. There's ours up at the top, it's pretty, nice colors. And frankly, when I'm feeling really mischievous, 
I put the coroner's office up there beside it, which is the exact one as the Ministère de l'Education, as the Centre de Service Scolaire de Montréal, as the Ministère des Finances, right? They're all the same. So this is school identification, also now dictated by the Ministère de l'Education. So you see on the left, I'm wandering away from the microphone, this is a call St. Catherine de Sienne in my neighborhood in NDG. Brand new school, lovely school, marvelous. You see it there. That's what's required from the Ministère de l'Education. On the right, you see Willingdon Senior Campus of, I changed school board, Cindy, but that's okay. The English Montreal School Board, that's the territory I live on. Willingdon Senior Campus, I actually went to Willingdon School, but not at that location, another location. Now there's a, there's a difference because school boards, administrators have decided that there's a certain character to these symbols that should relate to the community as opposed to the government of Quebec. And here's one that always gets people going, one way or the other. So this is St. Monica's. Who said St. Monica's? Shout out to St. Monica's School on uh, Terrebonne Avenue in NDG. Any observations? Not every English language school flies a Canadian flag with the, with the Quebec flag. Some schools have no flags. Right? So there's either no flags or it's both flags. I challenge you when you leave here, return to your communities, walk around your neighbor, neighborhood. You will not find a single French language school flying a Canadian flag. They are not allowed. Not allowed. You know, obviously as a a pol there is a policy in place to have everything look the same. It's cookie cutter. Look the same. And ladies and gentlemen, I, on an off day, I sometimes wonder if the government of Quebec wants us all to sound the same. I simply want to observe that not a single French public, I did that. I firmly believe, ladies and gentlemen, that symbols are important. And symbols can reveal a great deal about people and organizations. Bill 40 represents a loss of autonomy of our community by diminishing the autonomy of our school boards. More power is transferred to the government of Quebec and to the Minister and Department of Education. This is indisputable. Justice Lucier of the Superior Court said as much in black and white in his judgment. One of the examples, not pedagogical, of the autonomy of school boards is the issue of, or use of, air purifiers in classrooms without mechanical ventilation. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Quebec would not authorize, would not authorize, the installation of air purifiers and would not pay for their purchase. This despite the fact that numerous jurisdictions around the world, including Ontario, were doing precisely that. Apparently, Ontario ordered something like 50,000 air purifiers for their classrooms, which are not mechanically ventilated. Not a single air purifier was installed in a French language school because French language school service centers did not have the autonomy to buck the government on this decision. A number of our school boards made the decision based on what was happening elsewhere to ignore the position of the government of Quebec and install air purifiers in classrooms without mechanical ventilation. Research on, guess what? The airborne transmission of COVID-19 seems to indicate that that was the right decision. Bill 23, which is currently before the Quebec National Assembly, accentuates this centralization of power and loss of autonomy of school boards. 
If adopted, it would empower the Minister of Education to fairly arbitrarily annul decisions of school boards. The bill also transfers the authority to appoint school board directors general from the elected Council of Commissioners, where it is currently, to the government of Quebec, essentially making directors general of school boards employees of the Minister of Education. Our directors general would, under Bill 23, report to the Minister of Education. Let's, let's, let's have no doubt about that. Not to the community through their elected representatives on council. The govern, government appointed director general in turn appoints principals and vice principals in the schools. So by delegation, you have the minister of education appointing a director general, that person then appoints principals and vice principals in, 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 in our schools. These provisions are clearly further infringements on our constitutional right to control and manage our school system. And yet another example of the government of Quebec's increasing authority over our school system. I heard Minister Drainville respond by saying, not to worry, he will appoint Anglophones as director generals of school boards. Don't worry. Ladies and gentlemen, this completely misses the point. It's not who gets appointed that's critical. It's who gets to make the appointments. We have school board directors general who are francophones. But that choice was made by the minority language representatives. That is to say, by the elected council of commissioners. By the way, with Minister Drainville saying we'll appoint anglophones, he will appoint anglophones, I'm not even sure legally how he can assert that he will only appoint anglophones to these positions. C'est du n'importe quoi. I can assure you, because we talk to them regularly, that not a single French language education council or school board outside Quebec would accept this level of interference and control from their respective provincial governments. Allow me some observations on diversity and tolerance and the relationship to control and management of our school system. Bill 21 prohibits English language school boards and French school service centers from hiring teachers and school administrators who wear religious symbols. This includes turbans for Sikhs, kippahs, also known as skull caps for Jews, and hijabs for, uh, for Muslim women. It would also cover the wearing of a cross or crucifix as well. That means, ladies and gentlemen, essentially, that Jagmeet Singh could not be hired as a teacher in Quebec. That Malala Yousafzai who proudly took, Jean-François Robert proudly took a picture with when she was here in Quebec, could not be hired as a teacher because Ms. Yousafzai chooses to, to, hire, to wear a hijab. A number of English school boards are publicly opposed to these prohibitions on the grounds that it sends the wrong signal on diversity and tolerance to the children we educate. The QESBA also opposed the Bill 21 for the same reasons, and we argued that it was unconstitutional. As an aside, it's interesting to note that Bill 21 does not, by design, apply to private schools in Quebec, nor to the Cree and Catholic school boards in the North. With regard to the Cree and the Inuit, the government explained they have a certain degree of autonomy because of the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. An MNA from the governing party sat there and told me, no, 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 we can't apply Bill 21 to the Cree and the Inuit because of the Quebec the James Bay and Quebec Northern, uh, Northern Quebec Agreement, because we have an agreement with them. Apparently, the government of Quebec appropriately recognizes that agreement, but has no problem running roughshod over the constitutional rights of the English-speaking community to control and manage our school system. The English Montreal School Board challenged the constitutionality of Bill 21 in the courts, basing its, its arguments in part on the May versus the Supreme Court of Canada judgment, that recruitment and assignment of teachers and other personnel is among the exclusive jurisdiction of the representatives of the minority language community. In 2021, Justice Marc-André Blanchard of the Quebec Superior Court struck down Bill 21 as unconstitutional as it applied to English school boards. We forget that. He had to uphold most of Bill 21 because of the use of the notwithstanding clause but it was struck down as it applies to English school boards. 
Justice Blanchard found that Bill 21 was discriminatory, that it violated the Quebec and Canadian charters of rights, and that it infringed on the control and management rights of our community under Section 23 of the Charter. A section which cannot, by the way, be overridden by the notwithstanding clause. Thank heaven. The government of Quebec has appealed this decision. Believe it or not, I've skipped a part of my speech. I know you, you won't, you may not believe me, but I have. The government of Quebec has appealed this decision and the QESBA intervened in support of the EMSB at the Quebec Court of Appeal. I use this example not only because it goes to the issue of the values we're transmitting to children, but also because I suggest that this good fight or getting into, and I quote, good trouble as the late US Congressman and civil rights leader, John Lewis used to say, would not be possible if our community did not have the control and management of our education network through our school boards. It is inconceivable to me that had school boards been constituted as school service centers with the structures that was proposed in Bill 40, with the new structure where the director general is named by the, by the Minister of Education, that any school board would have the nerve or even could make the decision to contest a piece of Quebec legislation. Let me be crystal clear, given the experience of the past three years with Bill 40 in force in the French network, but not in ours, I am utterly convinced that had English school boards been replaced by English school service centers as per Bill 40, no challenge to Bill 21 would have been undertaken in our network. In the past three years, unlike school boards with their elected councils of commissioners, French school service centers have been reluctant, no, more than reluctant. They have been unwilling to publicly challenge the government of Quebec on any substantive public policy matters relating to education. A few words on the QESBA's big legal win on Bill 40. Bill 40 is not in force in our network because of an injunction awarded by the Superior Court in August of 2020 and confirmed by the Court of Appeal later that year. In July of this year, two, two and a, some odd years later, it was worth the wait. Justice Sylvain Lucier of the Quebec Superior Court handed down a judgment on the merits of the case, which was a resounding victory for English school boards. In a 130-page judgment, Justice Lucier found that the contested, the contested provisions of Bill 40 were unconstitutional infringing on the control and management rights of our community. He found that Bill 40 represented an impermissible transfer of school board powers and authority to the Minister of Education, and that it severely limited the election of people to the Council of Commissioners. Justice Lucier also used a broad definition of rights holders in terms of control and management, which goes well beyond parents with children currently in the system. As Justice Lucier wrote, it takes a village to raise a child. He didn't coin that phrase, but he decided to include it in his judgment. It was a sweeping win for our community. We haven't had a bitmoji for a while, so here's one. Unfortunately, the government of Quebec has appealed this decision to the Quebec Court of Appeal, despite the financial burden placed on us and our member school boards, the QESBA will continue the fight for our community's control and management rights all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada if necessary. And we'll undertake a new legal challenge to Bill 23 if it's adopted in its current form. Please believe me when I tell you we would rather not have to undertake these legal challenges. I am not a lawyer. They are, these challenge are, challenges are both time consuming and terrifically costly. But facing an existential threat to school boards, we have no choice. We would much prefer to be doing other more productive things than fighting the government of Quebec in the courts. But fight we will. Speaking of doing other things, I'm pleased to publicly announce that the QESBA and its partners in the English Education Network, including parents, teachers, school board administrators, in-school administrators, and the Quebec Community Groups Network will hold a two-day conference on English public education in April of 2024. The aim of the conference is to strengthen the vital link between the education community and the wider official language minority community and the society it serves. Share knowledge 
and develop innovative ways to make the public education system more effective. Questgren's own Lorraine O'Donnell sits on the program committee of this conference. Perhaps some of you will consider attending. I hope that I've convinced most of you, not all of you, I know that, if you needed convincing, that the control and management of our education system by our English-speaking community of Quebec is of vital importance to our future, and that locally controlled and democratically elected school boards, with all their occasional flaws, are a key ingredient to that control and management. We have the Canadian Constitution on our side, and happily, we're not alone. Several polls done by market, Legia Marketing show that we have English-speaking Quebecers on our side. We have the provincial parents associations on our side. Our administrators and teachers unions are supportive. Our vital community partners, such as the Quebec Community Groups Network, are on our side. The Canadian School Boards Association is on our side. La Fédération Nationale des Conseils Scolaires Francophones, qui représente les commissions scolaires francophones au Canada, est avec nous. Le Parti libéral du Québec, qui forme l'opposition officielle à l'Assemblée nationale, et le Parti conservateur, strange belt, bedfellows, sont avec nous. And last but not least, we have really good lawyers. Very good lawyers. Power law, who keep winning court cases. I'd be very pleased to talk to you uh, afterwards or during the break or at lunch on how you can help. We need to have flourishing institutions devoted to the well-being of our students, whether they be four-year-olds or 50-year-olds, which are responsive to the needs of our community and have a degree of autonomy from the government of Quebec so that my little grandson and thousands of others like him throughout Quebec can get the English public education they need and deserve. Merci, thank you. The first one is what kind of challenges do English school boards in Quebec currently face in recruiting and retaining educators? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and uh, someone like Cindy Finn or others would be better placed to answer it, but, uh, but I'll give it a stab. Um, you know, the challenges are similar in our network. We have a particular challenge recruiting French language teachers. Um, there was an initiative done by our own directors general to try and hire French language teachers from uh, outside of Canada, uh, outside of Quebec and outside of Canada. And so our school boards, by the way, before the Department of Education, the Ministère de l'Education was really active on this file, our school boards were looking at ways to recruit from elsewhere. Um, the retention issue is a problem. You know, I read somewhere, this is a statistic that's kind of dated, I think, but uh, something like 25% of teachers leave within the first five years. And that's, as I say, I think that research is a bit dated, but uh, it's, a, it's clearly a preoccupation. Some of it goes to working conditions, absolutely. Some of it, I think, went to salaries, which have, in the, at least for teachers, sort of, we begin to catch up with other jurisdictions. Um, some go to non-monetary issues. My daughter is a teacher. Um, she's currently in the UK doing two years of teaching over there. She's a McGill grad. She did her stages uh, both at Lester B. Pearson School Board and at English Montreal School Board. Uh, she's a McGill graduate, a B. Ed. You know, her stages, and she did a maternity replacement. She came home saying, Dad, I had no idea that I would be dealing with such social problems in my classroom, right? The, the amount of time, the teaching she enjoyed and got and was pre prepared for, but dealing with the as associated social problems was really, really uh, dragging her down. So, I, you know, we have to work on all those things. Um, there may be some distinct actions that English school boards can take and have taken, but it's, it's, a, but it's a network problem as well. Thank you. The English school boards 
have half the students in vocational training than the French sector? How do we promote vocational training as a positive model in the community? Right, another really good question. Um, I, I presume that person means proportionally. We should have much less than half, of course, because we only represent about 10% of the network. But um, yes, um, you know, there's a number of factors. I think in some parts of our community, there was not quite an exclusive value, but a very high value placed on a university education to the detriment of other types of, uh, of work. Um, you know, and so I think we need to tackle that. Some of it is the distribution of programs Cindy's nodding, that always gives me comfort when Cindy nods, that means I said something relatively intelligent. The distribution of vocational programs in Quebec uh, is a bit of a challenge. Right, right, it's, right. It's, thank you, Cindy. So it's the authorization to host these programs that have to come from the, from the Ministère de l'Education that's a problem. Um, but it's something we have to work on. You know, uh, if any of us have tried to get a tradesperson in the last little while, you know, try and get a plumber. I tried to get a plumber a couple of weeks ago. I phoned a company, which I know in, in, in NDG, and they stopped me and said, look, unless you're already a client of ours, we can't see you. You know, your pipe may be broken, but I, I can't, I, there's, there's no, the, 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 the labor isn't there. We see it in the construction industry, and the government of Quebec has recently um, brought in a new initiative to try and encourage people to, to take shorter courses in, in certain areas of the construction industry, and I think people are hopeful that will help. They did the same thing with Preposé aux bénéficiaires during COVID. So, you know, we, we all have to work together, I think. Um, parents, we have to work together. Um, the ministry, with school boards, with CEGEPs with uh, government actors and non-governmental actors to try and, uh, and boost that. Um, you know, the day when somehow an honors degree in political science was of greater value than being an electrician, I think they're gone. I, they, I hope they're gone. They're not gone everywhere, but I, you know, and, and by the way, there's lots of unemployed people with BAs in political science and very few unemployed electricians. Thank you. Thank you. We've got some really good questions. You'll have to keep your answers brief, I guess. <laughs> I'll try. Are success rates relatively high post Bill 101 because the French system, not the English one, receives many immigrants struggling with lang language, et cetera? Also a very good question. Um, uh, yes and no. In some areas, yes. In some areas, no. And what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, um, far outside the greater Montreal area, the levels of immigration are pretty low. And our school boards in many of those areas outperform, quote unquote, their school service centers, right? So absolutely, in the greater Montreal area, what we used to do pre-Bill 101, with dramatic success, by the way, which was to integrate people from all sorts of different languages and cultures into our school boards with fantastic results, now has to be done by the French language uh, school service centers and has been since 1976. I think initially it was quite a shock to them. They're, they're doing better now. Uh, there's still challenges. So, un peu oui, un peu non. Because if it was only the question of new arrivals and immigrants, our school boards in various regions with relatively low levels of immigration would not outperform their school service centers. What are the foreseen impacts in the short term following the increase in tuition fees? Oh, I'm... Ask, uh, you want a short answer? Yes. Ask Dr. Lebel Grenier. Yeah, we, we will. Should I move on to the next question? Yeah. Um, this is a good one. Why do so few people show up to vote for school board elections? Also a very, very good question. It, 
in my view, first of all, there's a community responsibility that needs to be addressed. You know, let me be candid, even in the presence of a severe critic of school boards, use it or lose it. November 2024 will be a tipping point, a, a point charnière. Because if we get turnout rates of 15%, which is what typically we have, I can hear the government going, who needs you? People don't vote. By the way, they vote at about four times the rate in the English community than they do in the French community. One, two, I would say, and I use my words advisedly, the government of Quebec engages in what I would describe as voter suppression with regard to English language school boards. Well, why do I say that? Well, they force school boards to pay for it, which means every dollar spent on promoting elections and organizing elections, on publicity for elections, on voting booths in locations, has to come out of a school board budget. Two, the government of Quebec refuses to twin them with, with municipal elections, as is done in virtually every other jurisdiction in the country. Three, the government of Quebec refuses to allow other alternative voting methods by mail, which is done in Ontario, or electronically. The Director General of Elections takes no interest whatsoever in school board elections. The, as a society, we spend millions of dollars promoting provincial elections, Quebec elections, and we spend virtually nothing on school board elections. So everyone has some responsibility in that, including ourselves. So, you know, I'm going to be checking the voters list in November of 2024. And if I see people that are on the list and haven't voted, you're in trouble. I don't care who you vote for. Well, maybe I do. But if we don't vote, it's going to be a real problem. So let's try to get the next two questions. In the Gazette yesterday, in the Gazette yesterday, 49% of English high school grads don't have the minimum proficiency that is needed to study in French at the post-secondary level. What do you have comments on that? Yeah, I don't know where that, that look, I read uh, David Johnson's column yesterday. Uh, I don't know enough about this to really comment. I know you're having a, there's, I think some research is being presented about French language acquisition and attitudes of young English speaking Quebecers towards the French language acqu acquisition later. Um, look, um, I think that our students who are in French immersion or French intensive or some variety of that are well equipped. Students in the traditional English stream are going to be challenged with studying in French. A lot of those students in the English stream, by the way, in the only English stream, many of them are special needs students. And if Catherine Korakakis were here, she would say that there is a real concern among parents. Some students just cannot handle that additional French and will not be able to handle it at station. And what does that mean for them? But I'm not a pedagogue. I'll leave that to the pedagogue. Yeah, there is a panel tomorrow. Best practices, right. French language, second, right. second equity. And, and attitudes yeah. are important. I did read some of the you know clips that 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 our students are not happy with the way French is taught necessarily in school. And there was a, is it the community learning experience or the CEL? I don't. Are any of the researchers here? There's there's other ways of teaching French, which is why I alluded to the fact that I think our school boards have to have that reflection as to how we're doing in terms of the, of the teaching of French as a second language. Thank you. And this will be the final question for this morning, formal question. Can you talk more about the QESBA's position on the new culture and citizenship in Quebec program? <laughs> Won't go back. <laughs> ah. To be completely candid, we haven't analyzed the content yet. We're going to be doing that. I hope other groups do it. Maybe Abby will do it, the Advisory Board on English Education. Perhaps our directors of the English Education Network will look at the content. So I can't even comment on the content yet. 
although it's a pilot project and has been sort of in the works for some time. I can tell you that the development of the course in English, and I would say not its translation, by the way, but its adaptation, and the adaptation of pedagogical materials in English is really, really late. School boards, teachers are going to have to start teaching this at the end of, October, of August of next year. And the English materials are in draft form. I'm not even sure if they got into the hands of the teachers who are doing, the, doing them as, as pilot projects in school boards. Difficult to get clear answers from the Ministère de l'Éducation du Québec on this subject. It's a real preoccupation. In a similar way that the new history course was a similar preoccupation of 10 years ago, right? These are sensitive subjects. Culture and citizenship in Quebec. My wife goes berserk. She says, we're not Quebec citizens. We're citizens of Canada. Never mind. Never mind. Quebec is a nation. I believe Quebec is a nation. You can have nationhood without being an independent country. Can you have citizenship without being an independent country? Probably. Sociologists would be better uh, placed to, to look at this. All I'm saying is that these are pretty sensitive issues. And if there was an area where the control and management rights of the community, as they relate to language and culture, come into play, it's clearly in a course like this, which is a point I stole from Stephen Thompson tomorrow. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Russell. Hi, I'm very happy to introduce our keynote moderator, Kate Lemaitre, who has been one of our, our previous keynote speakers. Uh, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself and tell you about her long, illustrious career before she introduces our town hall speakers and gets the show on the road. Thank you so much, Kate. Which one? You want to hold it? Sure. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for being here, for staying here. Everyone looks very lively, and that's good after a long day and a very exciting day. It's been quite a great first day. Thank you uh, to the organizers. Uh, my name uh, is Kate Lemaitre. I know very uh, there are a few familiar faces, more than a few. Um, long and illustrious career in education. I'm not sure about that. Long, for sure. Uh, teaching, uh, consultant, McGill, and finally chair of the advisory board on English education, which is one of the great successes of the English sector, I think, not without a little bit of bias. And I've now retired from that too. So I said in an earlier session, I am unaffiliated, which is a polite way of saying that I've retired. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel that we have here today, and uh, we're, we're down two people. I'll explain in just a minute. Um, on my far right is uh, Chuck. Um, I'm going to turn over and make sure that I get the... Yeah. Chuck Halliday, whose title is Coordinator of Community and Business for the New Frontiers School Board. For those of you who don't know, it's the southwest of the the province. Um, Chuck is in the continuing education department and he's <laughs> typical of people working in English education. He's had a number of dossiers and still does and served on a number of committees. One of them is the fact that he's the school board representative on the community learning centers. He's a strong believer in the power of collaboration and partnerships. That's going to come up in our discussion this afternoon, I know. And he believes that when stakeholders across multiple sectors, be they education, health, employability, social services, when they work together, they co-create best practices and strategies to support students. And that's the, that's the focus. And the families and the community and we sustain better. And next to Chuck is Lucy Roy. Roy, Roy, she says she doesn't mind which one. I think she's bilingual. 
And she is uh, the acting director general of the Riverside School Board on the south shore of, um, of Montreal. She's been doing that uh, for over a year. And she was assistant director general before that. She's been elected as chair of the Association of Directors General of the English School Boards for uh, this year and next. We were talking about second terms of things, so be warned, Lucy. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know about the next. <laughs> She's been Director of Educational and Complementary Services in Adult Education and Vocational Training and Technologies, and she will remind me if I say schools instead of schools and centres. And um, she's been, again, community learning centres uh, rep and international students rep in the adult and youth sectors and the provincial and regional receipt for adult um, learners. She's been a school principal in elementary and high school and has a B.Ed. master's degree in Ed Admin and a graduate certificate in Ed Administration and still studying, a role model for lifelong learning. She's currently in the second year of a postgrad certificate in Ed Admin with the University of Sherbrooke. So she is bilingual, I was right. Uh, next to me is Dr. Cindy Finn. Cindy is Director General of the Lester B. Pearson School Board on the West End of the island. Uh, approximately 24,000 students. It's a big school board. She's been Director of Student Services. She was Director of Student Services at Lester B. Pearson for 14 years, uh, overseeing com complementary educational services in the board's 55 schools and centers. See, I got it. I remembered it. Her degree is a PhD in school psychology from McGill, and she is um, she has some spare time, which she fills up with president of the Réseau Réussite Montréal and currently the president of the Learning uh, Leadership, sorry, Leadership Committee for English Education in Quebec, LCEEQ, another triumph of the English education sector. Um, she, her passion is creating and supporting healthy learning environments for students and staff. Now, there were, we were hoping to bring in um, a, a rep from Western Quebec, Jessica Fortier, who is a parent commissioner for um, the Western Quebec School Board. And she serves on the Special Needs Advisory Committee for services to students with special needs. She's the mother of two youngsters with special needs and obviously brings that passion to what she's doing there. And she's chair of the Special Ed Com Advisory Committee at the school board. Unfortunately, she took sick and isn't able to be with us today. And the, the last person is Jody Callahan. Jody is from the Listigush Mi'kmaq First Nation in the Gaspe. She's been an English teacher. She's been with the adult ed sector there uh, for 10 years, ever since the center opened. Um, I'm going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce Elausam Gawe Gina Morgwam, which anybody going to translate that? No, thank you. Maybe you won't be too critical of my Mi'kmaq accent there. But it means, according to Jody, the house of lifelong learning, which I think is lovely. <laughs> she has an MED in curriculum and instruction. She also has two very small children one just a few months old, and so she's pretty well tied to the gas bay and couldn't take the time to be here. So what I'm going to try and do, since we have spoken to both um, uh, Jody um, and Jessica, is try and represent what they were telling us as we have the conversation around the table here about some of these big issues and challenges. Um, we will be using Slido. <laughs> So if you were here this morning, you know that you can post your questions on the screen there, and we'll, both sides, both screens, so, and we'll tackle those uh, in the last half hour of this afternoon's session. So we'll spend about an hour with these good people sharing um, what they want to share with you, and then um, for the last half hour, we can try and address some of the questions, okay? So where to begin? Um, Changing realities 
in the English school system and what to do about them. So there are realities, the realities are changing. Uh, these school boards are trying to deal with this, these realities and trying to get around them, I suppose, what to do about them. Let's start with the big one, the old elephant that sits in the back of the room always, the uh, dealing with the government. <clears throat> <laughs> I beg your pardon, Russell? <laughs> You're not a government man. <laughs> we know that. I, I, I will start with a quotation. I've got Jodie's permission to quote a few of the things that she said from uh, Listigush. And one of the things she said was, we're so far away from the ministry. So she was talking partly about being in the gas bay, which is a very long way from most places in the province. But she was also talking about far away mentally, far away um, organizationally, and in a number of other things. And I wondered if that resonates with uh, Chuck or Lucy or Cindy. Anybody want to take a stab at this to start off? Lucy? Uh, say, uh, closeness to... Um closeness to the government. I, I mean, we do have representation at the ministry, but I guess because we're only nine, nine school board, nine English school board, it's hard to divide ourselves and to be everywhere, to have a voice everywhere and to represent the community everywhere. Um, as an example, when we uh, ask for a new infrastructure, for example, in the province, and we sit uh, with the ministry, um, the formula <clears throat> that's given to us in terms of allocating more classes for our building is based on the Santa Service It's not based on the English school board because we're a minority. So uh, when you look at the formula that's there, you have to adapt the formula to represent the English community in our needs. Uh, les classes d'adaptation scolaire, for example, does not exist in our, in our culture, the way that we, we teach our children. But it's one way where the ministry we are allocating uh, extra space in a, in a school. Um, so it doesn't apply to us. So we may be losing this. So there's always education to be done when we work to, uh, with the ministry at different level. Um, we have, and you all know that our children need to have uh, eligibility to come to our schools. Um, this is something that uh, if a child goes to a Sanders Scolaire, parents don't have to have this document. So there's extra step for parents to want to stand, send a child to our school. Uh, and again, having um, to deal with the bureaucracy, we have to always uh, put a mode of teaching and educating the people that are on the other side to make them understand um, how difficult it is uh, for parents to have this pressure to not obtaining documents on time. Uh, and, and this year in particular, um, there was a lot of students who stayed home for a long period of time. Uh, so therefore the Education Act wasn't- Because they didn't have eligibility? Because and... the eligibility you know, process was taking longer. Mm -hmm. So Education Act is not being respected. Parents are supposed to send their kids to school. They're worried. Some decide to send them to a French school because they don't want to keep them at home. So, you know, we have to live with this. We have to deal with this uh, on a regular basis. So we are not as far as, as uh, maybe uh, Jessica or Jody, but we're not that close either because sometimes we can't sit everywhere because we are only nine and we can't be everywhere. But we do work with them and we yeah, do sure. educate in them. Sure. And there's, there's a will uh, to understand and adapt, uh, but it's new people. So we, it's, it's always like a repeat and, and we always have to be sure and ensure that we have the right words to make, um, to have our, our right end of, of the stick. <laughs> yeah, I, and I would add, I, I think, you know, we have to be careful not to say the ministry as though it's one entity. It's a big machine. We're fortunate mm -hmm. in the uh, English sector, we do have an assistant deputy minister and Part of her portfolio is service to the Anglophone community, and there's a whole team of professionals who work there. Those folks understand our reality. But once you start moving out into the other branches, you know, it is an ongoing, first of all, it's an ongoing issue because personnel changes quite quickly in the government. 
But it's also, again, because we're tagged as le réseau anglophone, certain people think of us as a monolithic community that are uniquely anglo anglophone. And we're constantly saying, and we've been lucky, we've had the, the minister has visited uh, our two of our schools. I don't know if the minister has come to you yet, but the minister is making a tour. We've had the deputy minister come uh, again, visit our schools. <laughs> And it's always met with, ah, il y a beaucoup de Français dans vos écoles. <laughs> and we say yes, because all of our schools have varying degrees of French. Russell alluded to it this morning in his talk, but we have a number of schools that have immersion programs where students are beginning in French, so like significantly immersed in French, and then move to a more bilingual model. Others start with the bilingual model and stay with the bilingual model. And so our schools have really adapted to the reality. Our parents want our children to have French. We've got really strong Francais langue maternelle teachers who are teaching Francais langue seconde et langue maternelle. So it's, it's always about dispelling some of the myths that we're just this resistant group or, or not even resistant, just, oh, you have more French than we realized. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's always an education and they're very grateful at the ministry in the other sectors uh, to hear about that. Um, and really, we're always trying to promote working together. And I, I think there is a great willingness, you know, for the ministry to understand our reality. So right now, for example, we're all talking about a teacher shortage. And that is true in the English sector. We recruiting French speaking teachers is a, a challenge everywhere in this province. Recruiting teachers who can do long second is another challenge, it is different. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really uh, impacts us is all the people that surround the teachers. We need professionals who are bilingual. We need support staff who can work in multiple languages. And so that's a strain on the system because our universities and our colleges only produce so many graduates a year. So there's a teacher shortage for sure, but I would say there's an even bigger shortage of other people and, and of course, Long term, if you end up with a teacher shortage, it will affect your administrative ranks. We're starting to see that now. So it's about helping people understand the system has many parts and that the Anglophone realities are quite unique because we only have, as I say, three English universities. People assume all our teachers come from the three English universities. Lucy, uh, we go and recruit in the French universities. And again, those teachers say, oh, I could work as a Francophone in your system. Absolutely. If you're coming to teach French, you're going to work in French. So we've become a very bilingually fluid environment, but that's not always well known out there. So we have a lot of work to do, I would say. I, I, I want to get a check on this, but I'm just going to check, check Cindy. Um, Russell mentioned this morning the success in um, uh, the exams at the grade, the secondary four, secondary five levels in French, and <laughs> so you must be doing something right as far as French instruction goes. Um, what about um, immersion programs? At one time, they weren't funded in any way. Are they funded now any differently? No differently, just as a regular um, so, transmission, and yes. So these youngsters <clears throat> are learning in two languages. They're still doing well in Canadian tests in English, uh, if I seem to remember those figures. Um, and the schools, the schools and the school boards are doing this without any extra funding. Interesting. Chuck, did you want to add as far as the vocational training that was concerned or anything else? I can add more than just vocational. Go ahead. That's okay. I just want to thank you everyone for being here. You guys are the ones who are still here. This is not as many people at the beginning of the day. <laughs> so I acknowledge you still being here with your families and everything else. Um, I appreciate being with two DGs. I'm a little nervous. I'm that middle manager, coordinator of community and business guy. English school boards or my three kids under nine go with two bilingual schools. My kids go to a bilingual school, not an English school. And the reason I say that, moi j'ai fait mon école en français au début, primaire, 1976. Two parents came here and I started in the 80s. They didn't send me to the English school for a reason and I'm very glad they didn't at that time. But I know my system now. I'm very proud that I send them to a bilingual school. And I love my school board, but when I first started, we're the best kept secret. And I said, no offense, that's stupid. Why would you want to be a secret when you do something well? And that means, to your point, we're doing something well, but the narrative is nobody knows about it. And when I mean nobody, the people outside of this room who are making decisions based on 
narratives that they want to push along. 1% of the government, if I'm seeing some data, are English speakers. So when dealing with the government, the people who work there may not come from the community that is 10 to 12, 13%. That's a hiring practice that is wrong on all levels. And when we say working with the government, I may be in education, but I don't have an education background. I'm like the spy who's made it in. And I kind of, the community groups are saying we're not really easy to deal with. I got a lot of reasons and there's a lot of workshops I went to today. The willingness is there. We don't talk about capacity and the ideas are great. It's the how and the who that we just kind of surface area conversations. So when I speak with Service Quebec, Le CIS ou les MRC qui sont le gouvernement, ah oh, oui, il y a deux systèmes de scolaires sur notre territoire. I literally have to remind every one of our partners that when dealing avec les écoles, j'en ai 15 moi. And they have every right that every other one. And I love my partners, but it's just getting to know people. And the only way you can get to know people is by a relationship with a face, having the capacity to meet them. And what my colleague said, we are stretched. Mm -hmm. I love all the community groups that say we're going to work with the schools. And I know the first thing is, who are we going to call? The principal? The teachers? You can't do it if you don't have a plan. And the funding models don't allow us because we're stretched in a lot of different ways. So... Dealing with the government is dealing with the capacity shortfall that we have systemically over and over again because our territories are stretched. I got four MRCs, four counties to deal with, but I know I, I love my colleagues on the French side. They got two each and they got three of me and three of those. And it's always the same faces. I've seen so many familiar faces because this is the community who represent us and our needs. So. So you you have to sit at the MRC tables. I don't have to sit, but we should. It's not that I have to. How are we going to work with our partners and collaborate and do all these wonderful ideas if you don't have the capacity to be there? You can't send the DGs, but if you have, and it's, it's, it's a scale, right? If you have this many people in your educational services in a smaller area and you have two MRCs to work there, you can pull. But if you got four, they are four tables de jeunesse, quatre tables de développement social, quatre tables. Like, we're stretched all over. It, is there any nobody here from Central Quebec area? <clears throat> I think there are nine MRCs in that school board's territory. The which one? Yeah, Eastern Shores. I think has got five, and uh, if, I, if I'm remembering, Central Quebec. Nine. That's that's stretching yourself pretty thin. <laughs> Can I add Go ahead, Lucy, please. Um, I want to say, too, that what it creates, um, this reality, though, it creates that we become generalists. Chuck and I have very different responsibilities, but I know Chuck. <laughs> I can go to his school board. I know where he works. Um, it brings a closeness to us. Um, we do become generalists. Our hands are in many pockets. Uh, but it also allows us to become expert in different fields. Uh, when I was talking about eligibility just before, our technicians who apply the Bill 101, they become expert. They are an expert field uh, in within our each of our nine school board. Um, and one of the area that we can work in collaboration when we work with the ministry is to tap into that expertise to make sure that the ministry knows that we have the expertise and we can help alleviate some of the work, some of the bureaucracy uh, that would help our family. That, that, that leads me on to a, something else. That's, you said, Lucy, that you know Chuck and you can go to his board and you know him and so on. And I'm sure that's true of anybody who works in different school boards. Um, which leads to the notion of cooperation among the boards. Um, with Cindy's nodding here, I know. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? It's there are nine English school boards, as we know, and um, there is a. I over the, over the years observed a lot of cooperation among them, but these are the experts who know what's going on. Cindy, why don't you start? Yeah, um, many of you may have known the former DG at. New Frontiers two DGs ago, uh, three DGs ago, when Wayne Goldthorpe was around, he used to say, we skate on two ponds. Yeah. And that's wonderful because the Anglophone network has to work together. As Lucy and Chuck have said, we need to work together just because of economies of scale, but also we know each other and we can turn to each other and learn from each other. 
And then we also have parallel structures where we're organized geographically. So Lucie's board is in the Montérégie Est or Centre. Centre-Est, and Chuck is in the Montérégie West, and I'm on Ile de Montréal, and I'm also a bit in the Montérégie West. So we work with our colleagues in the French sector around, are we calling a snow day? Are we, how are we implementing the new AVAB plans? Because there are things that do roll out province-wide, and then there are things that are very unique to us. How are the DGs using the money that they get for through Canada, Quebec Entente, to address specific <laughs> needs in the system? And so we are stretched, but I wouldn't want it any other way because it allows that agility to, to decide, is this an Anglo issue? If so, we huddle. Is this a province geographic issue? If so, and we're all members of associations and we work well together. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, we benefit from that. And, and I think this morning the question was raised, you know, why, are the, why is the Anglophone community performing so well? And you know, everyone wants to know what's it, what's the secret sauce. I think, as Russell alluded to this morning, there's many factors, but there's documented research that shows minority language groups outside of Quebec also outperform the majority language groups. So there's something about our community being together, being able to collaborate, breaking down barriers. I mean, one of the things our French colleagues, they deal thing, with things on such scales they can't easily break those barriers down. Whereas we know, we pick up the phone, we can convene a meeting now with technology. We don't need the DGs to all come together. We do monthly, but now we have the technology to meet virtually. And so the, the, the ability for us to do some things just isn't there. We're 10% of the population, but we're also very interconnected. There's a lot of you know, people leave my board to go to Chuck's board, people leave Lucy's board to come to my board, and that benefits us because there's a common, a common understanding. Um, and we've also been known to create structures to meet a need. So mm -hmm. when uh, Kate was introducing me, she, she mentioned I, I'm currently sitting as chair of the Leadership Committee for English Education. That is a very unique group of people because it brings together <clears throat> folks who work on the ground in education in primary, elementary, secondary, adult, vocational, college, and uh, university, as well as the unions. The teachers union is there, the professionals union is there, and we talk about issues that affect education, and we have an audience from the ministry, the, the DSREA, the, the division that supports the Réseau Anglophone, so they get to hear what is the impact of something like Bill 96, not just on CEJA, but it affects all of us. And when we have issues and we're struggling, we're able to reach out. And Mr. Flock's here today. He was with us at LCEQ in June because we wanted the secretariat to understand why we have so many concerns about legislation that is impacting Anglophone life, not just in education, but across the board. But of course, we feel it in terms of you know, the education and success rates, but it also feeds into success Anglophones enjoy on the job market. And I know that's a big shared concern. Sometimes we talk about, we have a bridge to nowhere. We do an amazing job. Our students are bilingual, they're smart, they're motivated, they're global citizens, they're local actors. And they say, I don't feel I have a place in my own province. I need to leave. That is a sad thing because it is one of the best places to live, but our youth are not convinced that it's worth, I hear it from young people, it's not worth the hassle. Yeah, I'll go to Alberta and I'll be completely bilingual and they'll hire me. They're not wrong That's because right. there's a perception here that our French mm -hmm. isn't good enough. Our students tell us they don't feel confident to speak French in the workplace. And the, the data tell us differently. They're doing mm -hmm. very well, but it's a perception of belonging and identity, which is a whole other set of challenges. So I'll stop talking. You were talking about collaboration, but we're very fortunate. Um, and I think we do listen to, other stakeholders too, our parents have a very strong role in our system. They participate. Our schools have governing boards. Our, our, you know, our committees are populated with people that wanna make a difference. We have community representation on governing boards. Our colleagues in the French sector don't always have that ability either. Sometimes they are very far from their constituents. That's not true in the English sector. I think there's a culture of working together and, and the structures exist. And when they don't exist, uh, we have an ADM who decides to create one. That's what Leo LaFrance did when he said, I need to have a place where I can go ask everybody what they think about the same issue. And he created LCEQ or helped us create LCEQ into what it is today. So 
Um, and same with the Community Learning Center initiative. It's really a place for us to make our schools into community hubs. Uh, you, you quoted Wayne uh, Goldthorpe, and I'm gonna, uh, my recollection of one of Wayne's quotes was, we're less hidebound in the English sector. And I think that is, um, that is a, a benefit to the sector. We're less rule driven and that, that gives flexibility and allows for creativity. So the Advisory Board on English Education, which is the sister group to LCEQ, uh, writes briefs to the minister. Sometimes the minister listens, who knows? Um, but we write, we have been writing briefs to the minister. Lynn is the secretary there and will, <laughs> will keep me honest about that. Um, I, I, I wanna know more about cooperation though. I, I can see Debbie there from the um, CLC network. Um, Chad, do you want to talk a little bit about CLCs and what they do? Community learning centers, not CLSCs, but CLCs. 100%. Uh, the acronym at the beginning is the same thing I said when I was hired as a CLC person in 2007, coming from sports media. They said, you're going to work with the uh, CLC. And I was like, I know nothing about healthcare. And they're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm principal XYZ. Uh, a CLC is not a place. And all our schools, before ever the CLC acronym, Debbie may shoot me, there's things I'm going to go on the truck tan tangent a bit, our community schools, because it is the place where the community gathers. So having a place and an approach, it's an approach to, in a survival mode, work together to do what your families and your community and your students need. So the CLC center is basically, we have the ability to have a person a person who works with partnerships. To me, CLCs is just the partnership person trying to work to improve the quality of life for the students, the parents, and everything else within the system. It was 2007. So there's been a lot of great initiatives where intergenerational community groups coming together to show the services, helping community groups and other stakeholders. You want to reach this population that you say you want to reach. On va traduire ce document, s'il vous plaît because telling me how will we reach your English population and I have it and I'm great, but it's about a woman's shelter. And they're like, I can't find a way to get it to them. Let me help you translate this document when I'm gonna put it in the staff lounge when they're talking to a parent. There's some very simple, simple ways that are rhetoric where how are we gonna reach them? You gotta do what you gotta do. So the CLC approach was late. basically, we can circumvent some other ways. And there's a person who can work as the facilitator for the principal, to try and help that school population meet the needs. Well, if I were to say that 2% of English speakers are underemployed in this province, we should all know this, we should be saying this because that is not the perception of this province. I still hear this, I'm only 47 and I don't know anything about Eaton Center and Westmount from whatever it was in 1980, but I've heard people tell me about it, but c'est ça la population. Non, ce n'est pas la population. C'est une population bilingue, they live in the Montérégie West, they live in the Val, live in the Gaspé, the lower North Shore. I, I learned the, the accent. Um, they're everywhere, but we have to find ways. So the CLC approach is having people helping the schools reach those populations in different ways. And it's been a fantastic approach, but it's not ancré dans notre système. Because I'll say it, did you know that there's five or six different categories of employees or CLC people in our system, in nine boards? I can say for a fact they would not fly on another side. You couldn't have that person and that person doing the same job, but being paid $15,000 less mm -hmm. on the French sector. So when I'm asked by Superior Conseil, c'est quoi l'approche sans scolaire communautaire? There's a lot of amazing things, but if we're gonna appropriate this and put it into a system, because our French colleagues want the exact same thing. They want ways to connect with their network. We have to put it in our practices. And sometimes I believe education, our system, our inflexibility has stalled us in moving forward something. So it's a great thing. But we have to fix it because it's fantastic. And if I were to say the principal will take away your CLC person, I'm like, well, who's going to go to that meeting? Or who's going to give me that information? Because I'm getting calls left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. I need to make some efficiencies in the system. So I'm very proud that I kind of went up there, but I'm a CLC badge on my heart because those people work very hard year after year because they know the community and the school. It's the linkages. And we have to talk about the who does it how they do it, not just the idea of it, and let's just put it across the province. Yeah, they know the community. It's this local local knowledge, local initiative. Uh, the word local keeps coming up, and it did in, in my conversation with Jody 
Um, Kate, if I could just say, when they talk no, about go local ahead. government, that is where things happen. That's right. Let's talk about province, territorial. The local things is where things happen. So you need people from the community who work with the community and get to make new partners. That's all. Yep. Thank you. That's not. That's good to hear. Um, there's another great initiative, and I, I don't know which um, deputy minister, assistant deputy minister, spawned this one. But the um, we were talking earlier outside about the um, centers of excellence. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about the centers of excellence, Cindy? It's, a, it's again, a concept that only exists in the English sector, born out of necessity, mm -hmm. but um, very successful. Yeah. Uh, Lynn could probably give us a history lesson that was during her time at the ministry, but basically, you know, the, the ministry does have resources and provides resources. And as Chuck was saying, sometimes there's a certain way things are done and it just continues to be replicated that way. But when, uh, you know, we were successful as a community in getting resources to support our students with special needs, we, we said those resources that are going to exist have to mirror what we do. And in the English sector, as many of you know, we're a very inclusive, we adopt, we take on a very inclusive approach, partly because philosophically we believe that there is great value in having students with varying abilities in regular classrooms, everyone learns from another. But the reality also is that if you're in a very small community, there is no hospital program for a child, or there may not even be enough children in a given school to create a small grouping for a special education or adaptation scolaire class. So you, you have to be creative. And so when resources were made available to say, how are we gonna support those students with special needs? The, the philosophy was very much, well, we need to build capacity in all of the schools and centers because those students are in those classrooms. And so when um, those resources were allocated, again, the Anglophone community thought long and hard about it and said, again, no one person can meet all of the needs. And so this concept of a center of excellence, a place where one board would be responsible for gathering uh, information, sharing expertise, uh, building capacity, that could then be shared with the rest of the English network. And over time, that even evolved from one person running a center to let's have a few people. So if I take my board as an example, we host two centers of excellence, one in the area of autism, one in the area of mental health, and they, they adopt a team approach. So we have psychologists, speech therapists, uh, consultants in inclusive education who help support. So if a school in the gas bay calls and says, we're really struggling with this student on the spectrum, how do we manage this behavior or how do we teach this in this way that, that respects the neurodiversity, there are people who say, okay, I'll get back to you or I'll come and do a visit or I'll invite you to Montreal to come and, and there's funding to, to facilitate these visits. And, and similarly with our Center of Excellence for Mental Health, the emphasis was on healthy living, mental health, not psychopathology. And, and our colleagues in the Francophone sector are saying to us, you're like light years ahead because we're still talking about deficit models that when you're coded as having a special need, then you get some resources. We have long taken the approach, we will never have enough resources and expertise, but if we all learn a little bit about all of these things, we can do universal interventions that help prevent problems from getting worse. And those professionals that do exist can then spend time consulting with teachers and putting plans in place for students with higher needs. So the whole concept of the centers of excellence was really about managing very few resources. We're talking about the equivalent of one or two professionals for a whole area of exceptionality, but because we do the capacity building and the sharing, it we stretch that resource. And so it works for us. And we're the envy, I would say, of some of our colleagues in the French sector who say, we're still stuck in a test place fix model. And we, we just don't see students with special needs in that way. They're in our schools, they're integrated. We give services as much in the school as we can. And then yes, in Montreal, we have some extra resources in terms of outside health partners but in the regions that they don't. So it's the teachers learn the skills, the consultants teach, the, even the principals learn as much as they can through that center of excellence model of capacity building. So it's been very successful, I think for us, um, uh, you know, as a network, again, taking limited resources and really trying to maximize their impact. I think I'm gonna to go to these school board leaders for some budgeting advice. They seem to stretch a dollar a very long way. <laughs> Lucy? A, a similar example for the vocational sector. 
uh, on the vocational training center, there's uh, also centers of expertise. Uh, they are now at the end of their, their, their lives because we also depend on funding to have these initiatives. Uh, but the Center of Expertise in Vocational has a very similar approach where each of us uh, has a program and different sector on vocational and we become the expert in it and we train other teachers, we welcome teachers to come and we modernize uh, the equipment on these uh, program for each of the centers that becomes a center of expertise. <clears throat> and this is how we collaborate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for this uh, initiative, uh, fundings, we do depend on fundings. It was mentioned, I believe, before by Cindy about the Entente Canada-Québec. So we get federal funding uh, to help us with these initiatives. And they are essential because uh, in vocational, for example, when a program, uh, a study is being developed, it's always developed in French. It's never developed in English to begin with. It's translated in English, not always at the same time as uh, as it's created in French. So we often have a little bit of waiting uh, to have to deal with. But we also don't have the expert uh, in the field that sit at the government uh, tables uh, to have the discussion. So it's important for us to develop the expertise internally. Um, but unfortunately, we have to prioritize some of these envelopes that are given to us. And uh, this one in particular is coming to an end. And uh, Chuck is a little bit aware of that because he's the fiduciary of, uh, New French is the fiduciary of this envelope, which is coming to an end. Um, <clears throat> it brings me also to, to share with you that in vocational training, when the uh, business is working with us to try to have us work with them to train um, some new workers in the industry, uh, they work by, uh, by region. Each of the region in the province of Quebec has a coordinator that's um, allocated to them. And uh, new programs are being distributed through this coordinator. Uh, I was sharing with, um, with Kate just before this, uh, this event today that our region for the nine English school board is the province because we sit everywhere. Uh, however, with the ministry, we're not recognized as a region. So we don't have a coordinator. Our coordinators are sitting in each of our region. Uh, so we have to share this coordinator with our, our French counterparts. But um, another initiative where we were able to work together is to create a position where we finance this through Entente Canada Quebec to have our own coordinator who go and sits at different tables to ensure that the English community gets the same information and the same opportunity in the vocational uh, training uh, centers. However, this money is coming to an end too. So uh, as we are uh, gathering to try to figure out how we're going to finance this, well, Kate said it, we become very uh, creative with our financing. <laughs> you, I'm hearing this sort of lack of support for local initiatives, which just reminds me of something that Jody said. Um, one of the things that she's been doing in... Um, in the gas bay in her adult ed center <clears throat> is working on the development of the new history program for the adult ed sector and um her, she was she was describing the lack of any celebration of indigenous history and the, uh, russell was talking this morning about the lack of um, input as far as anglophone telephone issues are concerned and and i was remembering what jody had said she gave an example she said oh yeah there was a consultation um there was a telephone call from somebody in quebec city i don't know who they didn't identify themselves and they had all the um, first nations um, centers at the other end of the phone if you like so there was a one-way conversation Conversation is the wrong word. There was a delivery of information from Quebec City to all the centers at once on a Wednesday afternoon. And the, the program was described and the new history curriculum was described. And the person on the other end of the phone said, um, can, you, can you share some of your resources with us so that we can include them? Oh, yeah, sure. By Monday. And this was a Wednesday afternoon. And they said, no, it's not possible. So 
no, they didn't want to cooperate, so that was the end of that. So that sounded a bit harsh, but um, it was something that she was very anxious to, to share. Um, I, I'm gonna, I wanted to move on to something else. You would, we've talked about staffing and hiring, and um, I think you said, you know, the, if you don't have the teachers coming in, you're not gonna have the administrators to be drawn from that uh, pool of, of teachers. What are the issues here? What's, I mean, there's, there must be a lot of um, strain and stress on administrators and teachers, given shortages and given all these various things. What about the mental health of these people? Is it an issue for, for you folks in management and middle management? Cindy? Yeah, it, it's often pointed out that, um, you know, as Anglophones, we, we tend to uh, jump first, plan later. Um, and, and because when we recognize a problem, we're eager to tackle it. So pre-COVID, if we can take our minds back to 2017, 2018, our directors of HR, you know, all of our boards have directors in different positions and everyone has an HR department and they meet regularly. And that's again, a strength of our system. The DGs meet, all the directors of different services meet and the, the DHRs were taking a look at the data saying we have more educators out on burnout, stress leave. Like, yes, we're still seeing high rates of absenteeism due to illness like cancer and things like that. But mental health, this was in 2017. Mental health is a real problem. What are we going to do about it? They came together, they discussed, they researched, and then they came to the DG's table and said, we need, we need a project. And so in 2018, we surveyed all of our staff, all of the boards, the nine boards we surveyed. We worked with our um, employee assistance provider. They had a survey. We, we surveyed all of our staff, and we all got our results as a province, as a network, we got our results as an individual board, and then we were given additional monies to say, try to address some of those issues in your board. So in my board, a lot of the issues were work-life balance. People were having trouble. And this was all pre-COVID. So imagine how it all got amplified a year or two later. So we started doing some initiatives um, that recognized that. And, and then COVID came along. And then during COVID, the government said, you know, we might need to start thinking about the mental health health of our students and our staff. And so that was great, but we were already on that train. We had already, you know, done that work. Um, that project has since sort of sunsetted, but the, the problems remain, the challenges remain. Um, and to the point where, you know, now in the, in the, the last round of collective agreement bargaining, you know, the unions were also pushing for our teachers need to be supported. It's not enough to have a degree and say, great, go teach because the data show people don't stay with the profession or they're burning out or they're getting sick. So it's now, you know, part of our culture. We do have mentoring that's happening for new teachers. We do have coaching that's available for our administrators. And so we, we have tried to create solutions. Sometimes we're so ahead of the curve that we're doing the work before the money comes from the government. But when the money comes from the government, we know how to use it really well. So that helps us stretch those dimes. And fast. In, yeah, and fast. So that's why I say sometimes we jump before we have a full plan. Um, but that's not a bad thing because it allows us to be agile enough to respond. And, and so again, a lot of the funding we get as a minority language group helps us do that work, but because we collaborate, we, we use that money very efficiently, I would say. I don't know if you want to comment more on mental health and wellness, but. Uh, maybe not on, on the mental health, but the, um, the structure even of, of, our, of our school system. Um, we do our staffing much earlier. Uh, we're less bundled by the, uh, the union. We work very closely with the union, actually. Teachers union, support staff union, professionals. And it allows us to do our staffing earlier in the year. So when we, sometimes when you, you hear in the news, you know, how some schools, some schools board don't have enough staff, it's because often this starts much later in the year. Um, we also have a lot of loyalty to our schools, right? I mean, uh, many of our, uh, of our students, their parents came to yeah. that school or their, their grandparents volunteers or their aunt is a teacher in the school. So that loyalty to the school makes it that it's a little easier for us also to have that retention, right? If, if I could just add, when we talk, you know, I've always gone, like, you want people to live here? Well, they have to be able to raise their kids here. They have to be able to work here. They have to be able to play here. Uh, the largest employer of English speakers is who? Probably our school board. So the fact that you say loyalty, of course, because they want them to strive. 
but uh, you couldn't get me to be a center director because I have choices in life. Talk about the brain drain that already happens. You're looking for a certain skill set. People who have choices and can see the working conditions are going to say, maybe not for me because they have that choice. Then we have to be very fair to the people. I look at my center directors and principals. They used to juggle, then they juggle fire, then they juggle with the hula hoop, and they juggle with sharks now around them. It's just got more and more demands on their time for more and more and more. Would you do their job? My wife's an adult with intellectual delays teacher. She loves her job. She cries at home sometimes. She cries. It breaks my heart. But she loves her job. There's a reason there's a strike. And I know I'm in administration and we can't go on strike. But this is not an English-French thing. We have a system that is, I'll say it, sorry, Mr. DG, is broken. I know I'm not supposed to say these things, but it's broken. And it's archaic and it's layered and it's not efficient. We can talk about, we do what we can, but we don't talk about the elephant in the room. We need to fix it. And we as multiple stakeholders in this, because when you have the choice and you can do different things in life, yeah, you give your heart and soul, but at one point you go work-life balance, my own mental health, you make the choices you have to make. It's not that difficult why we're in this position. I think we all know why we're in it because we have a system that's not really human right now to the humans who are working in it. I think there's also, if I may, okay, there's also, you know, uh, attracting people, but there's also the retaining of people. Um, and we do recruit um, people even overseas. Uh, we recruit people from all the university, but um, when you talk about Eastern Shore, for example, you know, finding the right people to go and work at Eastern Shore, maybe they'll go for one year or two years, the retention of having the same job for the same pay and being a little closer to, you know, uh, more population, um, it's a little harder to retain. So um, we, not that we compete with each other because we don't, but um, in some area, it's a lot harder to retain some of our staff. We've covered a lot of territory. Um, we've got about um, five or 10 minutes before we move to questions. What, what haven't we said? What, uh, what gaps have we left that you really think this group of people needs to hear about? Lucy's looking at her notes there. And... Yeah, I, I would, um, you know, again, one of the elephants in the room alluded to a lot in various presentations today um, was, was talking about how we're such a minority within the province and that we've really seen a decline in our enrollment. If you look at, you know, this is the year the school board network, the linguistic school boards and service centers are celebrating their 25th anniversary. So 25 years ago, if we think back to where we were in 1998, I went and looked up the numbers. So it's, a, it's not just decline, but it's a shift and we have to be mindful of the shifts. So when I look at where Lester B. Pearson was in 1998, we had 27,000 students in the youth sector. Today, we have 19. But when we looked at our adult and VOC data, we only we had less than 1,000. We weren't in the game in 1998 of adult and VOC training for reasons, you know, whether it was what the community wanted, if we were given permissions, we didn't have the infrastructure. We're, we now have over 5,000 students. And, and the reality is when you look at adult and vocational, it's a whole other segment of, of a population that we're serving. So when people say to us, you're not very diverse in the English sector, I always challenge that because again, you're, it's based on certain assumptions, but walk into any of our adult and vocational training centers. These are people who left the French sector. These are immigrants who arrived in Canada after the age of 16 or 18. They are not subject to Bill 101. We get those students in droves. Our adults, our adult learners have unique problems to integrating into Quebec culture because they may be an allophone, they may be an anglophone, but they're also trying to navigate a new school system. And for some of them, they're starting over. The number of students I've met who tell me, oh yeah, I was at Trois Lacs, I was at Marguerite Bourgeois, and now they're here because the law allowed them to come. Uh, is a different reality and they have very unique challenges and we're trying to respond to those. And again, the ministry is sensitive to that, we're starting to get some resources to help in dealing with diversity and all of that, because we do have diversity. We've always had diversity, but again, sometimes people don't understand. We, we have that clientele that 
you know, racially, socioeconomically, we have a lot of diversity. So it is true, we have declining enrollment, but part of it is, and someone alluded to it earlier, that Anglophone parents have choice. And we're very aware of that as school boards. Mm -hmm. You can go private, you can go public, you can go French, you can go English, or you can even go another third language. And it's about helping our parents understand what they will get by coming to us and what they sacrifice. So yes, maybe the bus ride's a little longer. Yes, mm -hmm. maybe the program in your community school isn't 100% what you wanted in terms of French and other extracurriculars, but you get a community, you get parent involvement, you get a lot of things in return. So part of our work is marketing to those families that aren't sure and dealing, as Lucy said earlier, I understand a parent who on you know September 20th said, mm, I really wanted to go to that English school. It's been three weeks. My kid can't get into an English school. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go to the French school down the street. We understand that. That's probably a wise thing for a parent to do because education is a right. So we have things that we need to fix in the system and we have to adjust to their changing realities. And I think COVID really changed things, accelerated things. I know from talking with Lucy and the DG at Chuck's board um, and even in my own board, we're seeing growth in certain areas. It's not all a bad news story. It's declining enrollment in some places for very specific reasons, but Chateauguay is growing. Uh, the South Shore is growing. Uh, St. Lazar, St. Clet, where, where I am, is growing. We have authorization to build a new school. We're just having trouble getting, actually, we can build two new schools. We're just having trouble getting land because we have to knock on all the different doors of the municipalities to get the land. So that's a different, you know, it's a different challenge. It's, it's, it's a good challenge. It's always nice to be in growth mode, but we're balancing systems that are sometimes uh, they're growing in some places and shrinking in others, and you can't pick up a school and put it on wheels. If we could have figured that out, we would have done it already. So some of our schools are over capacity and some of our schools desperately need to be renovated. And we have shifting demographics. And what we're experiencing is tough. It's nowhere near what the French sector is experiencing. They are really, especially in the Montreal, the Couronne, Metropolitaine de Montréal, they are being hit hard. And we've even said, we wish we could help you. We wish we could, we've offered, we will take in students from Ukraine. We will take in students from Syria. We will take students, but the laws don't allow it. But our colleagues are suffering as well in different ways. So it, as Chuck said, the whole system needs to be looked at. It's not just Anglo-Franco, but there's a lot of shifting uh, pieces, moving pieces that weren't there 20 or 25 years ago when these systems were created. Uh, I just wanted to, two ahead. two things. Uh, you asked me I would, when you first started. I could talk about vocational. I'm not even sure if I talked about it yet, but just this one thing: we have a town hall. I appreciate it. We have a town hall tomorrow. Today was the elementary and secondary. Tomorrow was the CJEP and university. CJEP, just CJEP. Just CJEP. Okay. Where is vocational even in the discussion? So we can talk about all the other things. We have a community need to show this is a pathway that leads to success and employment within the people in this room. And I appreciate it. And I, it's not a criticism, but we don't do it. And when we talk about employability in 28,000 people, we can move that needle. 28,000 English speakers could be hired tomorrow to match the unemployment rate in Quebec. Most of those jobs right now are in the essential service people during COVID who are all in the trades. I could say almost when we talk about that. That's one thing. And the second thing is I got three boys. I was born and raised here. My mom came from Toronto. My dad came from Nova Scotia. They came here for the Olympics. Good for them. It was wonderful. <laughs> we stayed in Shattagate and love the place. I wanted to leave long time ago because there was all kinds of these options, but I love it here. And it's like you said, we are part of the solution, not the problem. And there's this really, really annoying and wrong narrative that makes us somehow part of the problem. When we do things, we do it well. And I told sometimes you can't be loud you can't say when they're facts they're facts but we need to be better at saying the facts and helping put this story on the map because i have a ton of francophone friends who are like mm. it is not about the protection of the french language Je suis fier d'être bilingue. and i said it one time 15 years ago at a clc conference are you anglophone or francophone and i was this 30 year old young guy going, why do I have to be that? Mm -hmm. I'm bilingual. I'm bilingual. There's all these identifications that are all different things. And I keep going, why do I have to be one or the other? Because that pits it against it. I'm a bilingual Quebecer from Canada. I'm very proud of that.
Here's more marketing right there. <laughs> Maybe uh, just one more thing on yeah. the enrollment. I, I think too that sometimes we're missing the opportunity uh, because we don't have the infrastructure and because sometimes we don't have exactly the, the demographic of who the students can be in our schools. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, on the Monterigi, there will be uh, two uh, major uh, economic development. One will be a port in Contrecarve. And uh, we just heard there will be a big plan there to build uh, batteries for uh, cars. Um, all of all these workers coming to the Monterigie, um, we don't know who those families will be. And we don't know who's going to establish themselves in the Monterigie. We don't know who will be eligible to English education. However, uh, the French school service centers that are on my territory, they know exactly how many students will be going to their school. So they can plan right now in asking the ministry how much room they need for the future because they know how many students are actually moving there. We know how many students are moving there, but we don't know which one will be coming mm -hmm. to us. So it's always a bit of a gamble. And because of that, we don't always have the infrastructure to welcome the new students for the four years old, for example. Uh, we can all have new four years old uh, classes in our schools, but we don't have the space for it. And if you're a parent and you had a four year old that started school and you started your your schooling in the French schools where you get to know the secretary and the daycare and the bus drivers, and there's a pretty good chance you're gonna stay there. So if we don't have these four years old in our English schools, we're missing an opportunity to grow. Thanks a lot, Lucy. That's, um, this is a pretty passionate group right here, as you may have noticed. Uh, it's, I think we should move on to the questions, if that's okay, folks. Um, uh, here we go, first one. And you can you can see them on the screen. I can see them on Anna's computer. How can the Entente Canada Quebec funding make a deeper impact on the English language education system in Quebec? I mean the the Entente Canada Quebec is is everywhere. It's in every every government, right? It's in the, it's in the health sector as well. We get a we get a pocket of it in education, and uh, we have a system where we um, we identify priority. Uh, how can we how can we can stretch it even more? I mean, really, it would be to get to get more of it because uh, often we are we are kind of like obliged to rules and regulation that comes with it. A lot of um, accountability that comes to it. So it's not just uh, an envelope that's given to us and say you are the expert. You know what you need it. So here's, here's the money and then use it properly. But it's more, we're gonna give it to you, but it comes with these rules and this accountability that comes with it. And often there's a, there's a heaviness to it. So if um, we could have a little bit more flexibility in how we, we wanna use it and how we can use it, that would certainly be, I think, in my opinion, more beneficial. If, if I could just add, like I work with the CHSSN, uh, that Canada Quebec Entente money, so that's in my region. I need a group who will get that funding to be able to work with my schools. So we need to have flexibility, but we also need partners who are in that who can also help us because it's on the teachers and the, to do it, we can't do it. You need strong partners. So they need to be strong to be able to help you know, the whole community. But if not, and if we're working in silo, then we're not really helping each other, right? So that has to happen too that uh, for our board, uh, we were with a, a group called the Monterey West Community Network. So around eight years ago, it was a volunteer group. It was a they were just volunteers. Now they have around 12 employees and a million dollar budget to work for health and social services for English speakers in the Monterey West. I need them to be able to do some of the things that we can't do. So we need strong partners. So they need to be supported in that. Thank you. Uh, Can I just add something? The last year of figures that we had for the Atlantic Bay, 60% of that money disappears into the Treasury Board. Mm -hmm. It just vaporizes. It doesn't vaporize, <laughs> Russell. <laughs> <laughs> disappear, disappear, I'll accept. <laughs> disappear. But it, um, uh, it, I think the issue might be the tracking the accountability, the reporting, one of these things? Well, we could, Would we that could, be fair? Well, we can track the amounts that go to the education department. Absolutely. The education department gives us those figures. It's the 60% that goes to Treasury Board where there's absolutely no track. Okay. 
I put you on the spot. <laughs> And someone who could help with that is the Minister of Finance today. Yeah. Um, Bill, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know you've got some inside information <laughs> on this. We're kind of going two directions because Lucy mentioned, you know, um, reduce the kind of some of the reporting requirements, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're saying we need more reporting. So there is that little bit of, um, although we can, we can allow ourselves a bit of cognitive <laughs> dissonance, I guess. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, they, these are very interesting and important questions. Um, the uh, kind of standard response for the governing effect would be the federal money that comes into education through the Canada Quebec agreement represents less than 5% of what we spend on the English language system. So the federal government transfers 65 million, roughly 70 million on a good year, and the government of Quebec spends close to a billion. So, you know, th there's a bit of a sense too that, um, and I'm, I'm kind of not so much repeating the party line, but just uh, by the way, I mean, I, I used to work for the federal government. I saw those agreements from the federal side. Now I see them from the provincial side. But kind of understand, I think, both sides of the, of the, of the problem. But in a sense, you know, clearly education is a provincial jurisdiction. Uh, the government of Quebec, you know, we've been accepting federal money since 1970. But the government of Quebec was way ahead of the rest of the provinces in terms of minority language education, you know, at the outset of these programs. So there's a, there's a bit of a sense that... Um, it's our jurisdiction. We do support the English language system. We have for generations. Um, why should the federal government tell us what's important? You know, we, we would say that uh, DSRA yeah. has an ongoing relationship with all of the players in this room. And, um, you know, is, is it sufficient? Is it, is it uh, the, per the perfect solution? Probably not really, but I, I think that um, um, it, it's, what's a more useful argument or question to ask is, what are the, the unmet needs? And what are the additional costs related to having a second language system? And how is that system properly supported to achieve its goals? I, I think that's the way I would phrase the question. So, and I think... I, I didn't anticipate this one. Yeah, <laughs> no, this was a bit of a surprise. I, I apologize for putting you on the spot. The other thing I think we have to be cognizant of, like I see it as a, a signal or a symptom of a bigger issue. So we talk a lot about ECQ because... As we've explained in various examples, we, in many ways, the money that does come, there are mechanisms to discuss priorities, to arrive at consensus, to control and manage resources. Mm -hmm. So if I loop us back to this morning, I think part of the reason we focus on this, it's kind of like, you know, psychology 101, the key to not getting stressed is control what you can control. So we, we have a lot of control there. I think the bigger issue, more existential question for our network is, and we're seeing it through the challenges in the various legislation and, and different ways, but just the whole concept of as a minority language group, what should we be controlling and managing? Money that comes from federal transfer dollars or how about the ability to create, design, adapt our own curriculum, not wait for a translation? How about people being able to say, we would like to have our assessments reflect indigenous black people of color history rather than poor teacher saying I'm doing all of that while I get you ready for the ministry exam that will test you on things that someone has decided is central to your graduating Quebec high school so I think it's the bigger question is and I really think it you know Judge Lucier gave us a lot to think about I've read part of that judgment everything from the government needs to consult us more better hear from more groups um, to truly understand our needs and recognize where Section 23 says we can go. Who can we hire? What programs do we need? When you, we talk with our colleagues in other provinces, they are creating curriculum. There are things that are recognized in the government that minority groups are allowed to do, whereas we either feel we're not allowed to ask or we're told flat out, no, that's not the way it works. And I think to Bill's point about, you know, Sometimes when you're really good at doing something, but you don't change with the times, it then becomes uh, ineffective. And I think, although perhaps the minority language group in Quebec at one time was well served because numbers or philosophy or whatever, that's not the case. That's not what we feel anymore. That's not what the legislation that's coming down. That's not how we're interpreting it. We feel very much under attack. And so I think the bigger existential question is, can we not have a bigger say in other things than just ECQ money? 
I think it's a much bigger question. We are all taxpayers. We all have a stake in this province. We love this province. I mean, we've all said it in various ways at parties and call, uh, colloques and everything. If we wanted to leave, we could leave. We have opportunity. We're the most educated bilingual society, I would say, in Canada. And we have options internationally. And that's where I see the sad thing is that's where we're losing people. People are leaving not just Quebec, they're leaving Canada mm -hmm. to go other places. And, th and that brain drain is, is not. So we do need to think about how much, you know, it's all about tied into democracy and how much we want to be involved in our community. And I think the English community has been signaling for a while, we're ready to be involved, but you need to be heard. It's not just us talking. Someone needs to be on the other end listening. Thank you, Cindy. Um, here's one that um, takes us back to the very beginning of the uh, the uh, afternoon for a bit of the afternoon. What do you see as the key challenges and opportunities for fostering collaboration with the ministry? Silence. <laughs> Well, I think it's our it's our presence. If we don't have a voice, then they we can't educate, right? So, it's the number that's missing. Um, uh, and I, I can I can talk by you know from experience because I sit in many tables and I feel that I'm a nagger and I feel that I repeat myself constantly, mm -hmm. saying the same thing in different tables. But if we don't have the naggers, then they forget. So we have to be there. So it's an essential part of what we do um, as director general, assistant director general, as directors of schools, directors of centers, people like Chuck, you know, who has uh, a, a place in, in the community, we have to be there. Uh, and uh, it, it's important that, that we have uh, people in, in all of our school board that sits in these places. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the lack of funds and the lacks of people that we can be there, but that's really the, the place to be. Because when we have that voice and we nag, then, you know, they, they remember your name. <laughs> they remember my name. <laughs> I mentioned this to Russell this morning after his good presentation. It's, it's who we're talking to, isn't it? It's, uh, you, you've said it very well, Lucy, that uh, we've got to be there. We've got to be present at these yeah. forums and tables. And um, we used the term marketing earlier on. It's, uh, yeah, that's part of it. But I... Part of me is saying, why do I have to justify my existence? But if justifying my existence is going to make me heard and make me uh, respected a bit more than I have been lately, mm -hmm. um, I, in, in generic terms here, and then maybe that's what we have to do. Maybe that's the thing. Um, it was nice to see um, Graham Fraser's uh, article in the Le Devoir. Everybody writes to the Gazette. <laughs> Not many people write to Le Devoir and uh, La Presse. So, you know, maybe we should be preaching to the other choir. And I also think we have to be realistic about roles. Um, so when Lucy says we need to be at the table, you know, I'm very explicit when I meet with colleagues from the ministry, uh, even said it recently to the deputy minister, I I'm a pedagogue. I am not a politician. Yes, there are politics in all of our jobs. But I leave that to Mr. Copeman and the chairs and the councils, and, and we make that point all the time. There's a place, and that's why there need to be those different spaces for elected officials to talk to elected officials and for government people to meet with the people that, that need to take some of those decisions and consider the political fallout. I don't want to be that person. I'm very happy to go to my table and talk about what is the curriculum need here or what is this professional group going to do uh, you know, there, because that's what I was trained to do. That's what I love about what I do. I'm not in politics for a reason. So, uh, you know, it speaks a bit to what we discussed this morning that, you know, that level of governance is so critical because it frees us up. When we talk with our colleagues in the French sector, you know, they have a council and like a conseil d'administration, they have directors, but it doesn't fulfill the same need because the system has become so centralized. I can tell you, I've been a director general, this is my fifth year, the number of times I've had to say to ministry people, mm, mais vous savez, j'ai un conseil, 
vous savez, il me faut une résolution. Vous savez, mon plan de réussite, euh, ce n'est pas fini parce que je n'ai pas consulté mes parents. And so it's, they go, oh yeah, right, we forget because that system's gone for them. And if it, it may never come back, but that level of governance and that democratic voice, it needs to be, you know, everyone needs to do their role. That's not what I want to do. I'm more than happy that I have a chair and a council who fight that good fight. So it frees us up to talk to the ministry about what really matters, success for students. Mm -hmm. uh, we create citizens of tomorrow who are happy and healthy and productive and employable. That's what I want to focus on. And how they get there, the politicians need to sort that out. But without that level of government, you don't have that ability. So I really see the system, it may not be perfect, but I think that's the quote, right? It's, it's the best, worst system we have. And that leads very nicely on to the next question, the idea of student success, Cindy. Um, the question is, are there any programs or initiatives that have helped students get past this feeling of not being good enough in French. So programs or initiatives to help students get past this uh, glass ceiling that they observe. Because well, I, yeah, I was in a session earlier where they were talking about things they're doing in the SAGEP system to help students be more motivated and more confident in speaking French. Um, we've had some success in our board. We're really trying, um, especially when it comes to the French, to really help our students feel that comfort. So um, the islands on the board and the service centers on the island of Montreal are part of Réseau Réussite Montréal. And there's a lot of programs that exist to support. And so there's some people from RRM here today. Um, and there are, there are things that we do. And one of the interesting projects that we had started doing, and I think it kind of got stalled because of COVID and, and other issues, but was to help Anglophone youth connect with the Chamber of Commerce to look at opportunities on the island of Montreal so that they can have those work experiences. I'm a product of that system. I had a job with the federal government when I was in university and I worked at Dorval Airport in the heart of the West Island, but it was 100% French because we were part of a, um, you know, the, uh, the customs program. We worked in French. That's where my French got better. I got a great grounding in the immersion programs I was in in, in the, my school board at the time. But I needed, I needed that exposure and I needed that real world experience. Um, and so I think jobs become very critical vehicles for students to gain that confidence and to deepen and perfect their French. We all have experiences of people who went through school and learned a formal form of French only to realize that a different type of French is spoken on the streets of Quebec. And so you're always, so we used to be told, oh, you speak you know, French, the French from France, and we speak the, the, the <laughs> language of the street. And, and it's like, okay, I guess I'll learn both, you know, because I had a grounding and you have to have ways to practice that French. And I think there are probably things we could do more of um, to help our students be more comfortable and more uh, exposed. I know, um, I don't know if it's still running in your board, but at one point, Chuck, I know you had the option with billings in the, the option étude where you had- It doesn't now. I was gonna not. say it. Oh, it ended? It, and it right. ended for bad reasons because yeah. it was successful. Right. And I'm not going to say why the reasons, but you can so guess. So that was half the time in a French Gabriel Roy, half the time in Billings, you would take 10 from each school, put them together. You the, had the, 10 francophones. Op ten, option étude. Option, okay. Well, it was a, and they would. Spar étude. It's not a spa étude. Option. They, an option étude, they'd have half their school year in the French high school, half their year in the English high school. You have a close group of students who never probably would have met until later on in life that built another community those creative ways are done and sometimes because it's not financed in a certain way you have to be creative how you get the money you can't do it anymore because of the the capacity or whatever right and and even then the vocational health assistance and nursing uh we need some so they have a french test at the end so in our board we said let's give them a micro french course in addition to the trades that they have to do to get them to level to be sure that they can do the program because there's a new hotel a new hospital going to be built in vaudreuil and that's the only one in the multi-dg west who offers the program but I'll say it right now, and I might get in trouble. We have the doit provisoire to do this program. That means you have to keep reapplying every couple of years to do this. And that means a big thing. We do one group a year of probably people who live in the area who would work in the area, but the CIS is going to Africa to recruit internationally. And the government says, we won't give you the permanent right because they should go to Longay. When I'm in Huntington or I'm in Ormstown or I'm in Vaudreuil, 
I'm not going to Longueuil. Those things where there's creative th creative opportunities, these boards make them, but then there's downright bad decisions when you can't keep doing them. Maybe not a, an initiative, but, um, and I'm, I, I was hearing Cindy talking and I, my children falls onto that, uh, not, not speaking Quebecois, you know, like even though they have a mother that speaks French, they, uh, they went to French immersion and they have learned the proper French. So even with their, their cousins, uh, they're having a hard time having a, that um, fluidity of speaking the Quebecois. And I, and I don't know if that they want to because it's very much um, Franklish if you hear them on the bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but maybe not an initiative, but I think we, we won a little bit of a battle uh, this year. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, as, as, as early as uh, this beginning of the year, um, or our uh, vocational, not vocational, our um, general adult education centers were not recognized to give francisation uh, for the adults uh, in the centers. So if you were um, uh, an English uh, only speaking uh, citizen and you wanted to take francisation in Quebec, you couldn't take it. You, you had to take a French class through a community center. And uh, if you were an immigrant and you wanted to, a, a new immigrant uh, or newly a refugee, you wanted to take francisation, you couldn't come in our centers as well. You had to go in the French uh, system and you had to be, you were paid to go. But if you went to one of our centers, you didn't get paid. So we, we won uh, this battle with the ministry at being recognized to be able to give francisation. So we can help now as well our, our families to, to learn French and to have maybe a different um, perspective on it in their own families, because um, not everybody is comfortable to have this conversation with their own children about that language, you know, that second language in their home. But sometimes it even comes from the values of the family that limits, you know, maybe that flexibility of fluidity. So I think that having this opportunity to also train adults uh, through our own centers uh, it may be not an initiative, but it is, I, I find, like a win. Thank you. Um, now you see she's been too helpful now. I, I, a quick answer, please. I've, I've got one question that I really want to get to. So if you can give a quick answer to this one. Um, do these great initiatives, for example, CLCs, involve hiring people on contract rather than on permanent jobs? And if so, what's the impact of this on retention and so on? I can answer that. Some boards have them on a contract and their email stops in the summer because they got to get rehired. So some boards have that and that's the disparity of the categories of the CLC people across our board. Some are professionals, some are support staff, some are on contracts. And, and, and does that affect retention? Does it? Yeah, if you have yeah. the choice to have oh, a good yeah, paying just, job and want to stay and want to stay in a good paying job that's really important, and you're getting paid less than maybe another person who's doing the same job across the imaginary school board line, Yeah. put yourself in that position. Yeah. Of course it has a retention and that's 2007 since we started that. So it was a project, but we are far from that date now. Yeah, it's a long, a long time past. I want to get to this question. We've just got about um, if five minutes left, um, but I think this is a biggie and it's probably a good one to end with. Given the challenges that you've identified and the other ones that we haven't had time for, what's in the future for the youth sector in the English school system? Don't all rush to answer at once. I'll give you some time. <laughs> I have three kids who will be in the youth sector of the bilingual system because they're gonna come out bilingual. So I can't speak to everyone else, but that is a choice my family has made because we have faith in it. And I'm happy with the products that they come out. I hope as many people who have eligibility see what it is, understand what that type of education will give them so they can make an informed, an informed choice, whatever they choose. But I can say that's what will happen for my family. And I hope everyone who has that right at least knows that, that what this education they're going to get is going to be this type and not what they think it was or what potentially someone else says it is. The future of the youth sector. I think more and more parents are aware of their choice, but I think uh, we still have work to do. You know, uh, we have to publicize our schools a little bit like the private sector. 
because parents don't know that we exist. But when they do know that we exist, they want to come to our schools. And we know just from data that we have maybe a third, a quarter of what uh, the students that are eligible in the province are not coming to our schools, and we, that are coming to our schools. So we, we still have work to do. I think there are uh, myths or misunderstanding because as uh, Cindy was saying before, when uh, Monsieur Drainville went to her schools, he saw that children were speaking French to him. You know, I think there's a misunderstanding that that we teach students to become um, bilingual by the end of their, their studies with us and in all level of bilingualism. You're back to Chuck's best Bef secret before, again. Before Cindy says it, so our Ministry of Education didn't know there was a lot of French in our schools. I'm going to end the sentence. <laughs> well, I don't want to defend the ministry, but in their defense, I mean, we, we self-identify, right? It's le, le réseau anglophone, so oui. people get a certain perception. So I just gently correct them. C'est un réseau bilingue, et on est fier qu'on parle les deux langues. And, and, and they do get it. Um, I'm very optimistic for the future. I think one of the things we have going for us, and we hear it from parents who sometimes go other places and come back, is parents feel heard, there's a community of belonging, and... And I think, you know, if we can successfully recruit children, the four-year-old program will help us. We are very big believers in it. We're still working out, do we have enough teachers? Do we have enough uh, space in our schools? But I think that is when students come at a young age, we, we don't see a lot of people exiting the system. It's about can they access the system? So I think if we work harder on making sure eligibility, people know they're their, uh, their rights. And I think the other piece that's shifted, there's a huge gem demographic, at least in my section of the Monteregie, where many families are blended. There's a francophone mm -hmm. parent, an anglophone parent. They have eligibility by virtue of one of the parents and those parents love it and they're exercising their rights. So it's about helping people understand you have a lot of choices, make the best choice. And we do a lot of that now, come to our schools, open houses, um, you know, that doesn't exist other places because when, when I went to school, I went to the school that the postal code was the closest to the school. I went to that school. Parents have infinite choice, sometimes so much it overwhelms them. So we need to guide them better and say, make a choice, invest in a community and you won't be disappointed because that's what our, our schools do the best at. They're smaller, they're very invested, they welcome parent input and, and we're able to rally around some of those common problems and challenges, but we sort of dig in and, and solve them together. So I think that will save us because we we have to see ourselves as a, as a minority language group. That's been hard for some Anglophones. As Chuck was saying, the old perception was Anglos ran the province. That's that's an old myth. And, and we have other challenges now and we need to, and we're not all Anglos. We're bicultural, multilingual. And so it's about having the right to an education for our children and exercising that right. That's what it's about, not about an identity as an Anglo or a non-Anglo or historic Anglo. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> well, with my accent, I'm not an historic Anglo, believe me. Um, uh, look, we could go on all evening, obviously, because this is a great, uh, great resource of people here. I want to thank them very much for bringing a, a common perspective, but a diverse perspective to, uh, to some of these issues and thank them for the job they're doing every day. Hi, everybody. I'm Lorraine O'Donnell, and I wanted to thank Kate for taking on the job of moderating this uh, never dull panel. Uh, um, as you know, we like to experiment with new things at our forum, and I, I look to Anna for coming up with things like um, lightning talks, subtitles that are mostly good, except when they call bishops les évêques. I don't know if you guys <laughs> caught that. But it, it worked. People got it. Um, and also um, Slido, which is a good way of, of handling questions when we have a big group. Um, another thing uh, the group has come, the program committee has come up with this year is to invite discussants. So we're going to wrap up today with a short overview comments by two uh, respected people from the educational milieu. One is Dominique Michaud, our very longtime supporter of Questgren at the Office of Research at Concordia University. Dominique has a very um, deep understanding of how university research works. So if you have questions about that, she's the one to talk to. 
The second is Debbie Horrocks, who has worked with LEARN and particularly the CLC file for many years. We had also hoped to have Linton Garner, um, who unfortunately couldn't make it here, but this gives me the opportunity. Is Rosemary Murphy still here? Okay, I'm correcting an error because we said Linton was the president of QHFSA. He's the former president and Rosemary Murphy is the president and she was here today. So without further ado, Dominique and Debbie, we look forward to your comments to wrap up our long and interesting day. Okay, well, um, discussant when the role was presented to me by Anna was <laughs> like, just sit in and give us your takeaway from the day. So my takeaway from the day, uh, are, oh no, maybe we'll sit. Okay, I'll, because I still you need- can't see the writing, right? <laughs> no, that's it, I still need to put my glasses, I still need to read, okay, that's Sage. Uh, so I'll walk away with um, three concepts. Uh, vitality first. So, well, as you can hear from my accent, my name, I'm a Francophone. I will uh, adhere to uh, describing myself as a bilingual citizen of this province. I am very much so. My mother was Franco-Ontarian, put me in front of uh, English TV as soon as I was able to sit in front of it <laughs> and basically built who I am today. So I'll speak to vitality first because, and it starts with what uh, Russell was presenting this morning. I still have these numbers in my mind. So five out of nine English boards sit in the top 10 V5 versus V of 61. So you know what? As a Francophone, having sat at school councils in front of deserts, and I mean deserts, if I had 10 people in front of me, it was a good night. Congratulations. I mean, this speaks to the vitality of this, um, of this community. Um, and this will seek into community engagement. And as I sat through the day, and I sat through a very interesting session this afternoon. So I sat in the French only session and presented around Je m'engage, donc nous sommes. So this was a very interesting uh, project out of the John Abbott then adopted by Vanier College, whereas French language being mandatory at CGEP was designed as a course where the students actually went into the community and did volunteer work and reported on this volunteer work. If ever there was a, a good way to engage students, of, engage French as a second language students, that one was it, and I found it really interesting. And from this is being active in the community, then I'll circle back to um, community engagement and go to civic engagement. So that was this morning when I sat in the My City, My Voice presentation. And again, a model where students were youth, youth and students were presented with a mock borough council model and paste through the paste through what is a borough council and learn to prep the agenda, learn to ask questions as they should be asked. And from there, then build their interest and actually design um, an activity. And the, uh, the activity I, I noted down was uh, to design a survey, a poll. So from this, I find it's designing a toolbox that will actually engage individuals so this was designed for youth but i think somebody said at the at the session this could also be designed for older uh, individuals for other uh, segments of the population and develop civic engagement and through civic engagement this is where perhaps we can then i'll circle back to to russell and um he had a very interesting line this morning around voter suppression and the various means by which the director general is that I wasn't aware, but shame on them, shame on them for um, not uh, putting up, uh, not putting up the means and measures by which we can encourage people to actually vote in the school uh, in, the, in in those school elections, because even though you, and I've had these discussions many times over the years with friends, but I don't have any children. Why do I care? To which I will reply, uh, you are a homeowner mm -hmm. 
And I do believe you do pay school taxes. So if only to know what your school taxes are going to, you should be interested in knowing who is actually you using these funds. But, but it's all about, let's just build general interest around our school system and get people to be engaged to get, and this goes, then again, I'll go to, to civic engagement and um, how we can build it further to community. Okay, and I took Anna's explanation of being a discussant in a little different, <laughs> different way. And I understood it to be sort of give some highlights of the different workshops that I attended today. So that's sort of the, the way I'm the way I'm moving forward. And, and I, you know, starting with Russell first thing in the morning and the current reality of the English school system. I'm a product of French immersion. I was in the first French immersion, that's showing my age, um, French, first French immersion class in EMSB. Uh, wasn't even, it was a brand new school, Royal Vale School. Um, but I also, I don't feel fluently bilingual. I work in the English system. It's been, you know, English pretty much throughout my life. I also have three kids two of which who left this province because they didn't see a, a place for themselves in this province. Mm -hmm. Fluently bilingual, all three kids went through French immersion, fluently bilingual, but it's, you know, the current really reality that we're facing. Um, he talk, Russell talked about, you know, the constitutional rights of section 23. We've all heard about it, um, but, you know, we, we have to be proud of the 86.8% of, of students who graduate, um, you know, uh, and the government, you know, he, met, he said the government should look to us for guidance. They should be looking to us, but, and we keep telling them that year after year after year, and they just, you know, they just sort of blow us off type thing. So, um, and to me, it's always, you know, we've always been, the English system has always never been, it's always been a one size doesn't fit all. It has to be, every community is different. Every school is different. Every, every need, the, the needs are all different. And this is especially true for the English speaking community. Um, the centralization of power, uh, I work at LEARN, we're experiencing this centralization of power, like power overload centralization of power. Um, and it really do, does reduce the authorities, um, uh, the authority of the school boards. Um, we need flourishing institutions that are responsive to the community and the community needs. Um, I could go on and, and on a bit, but, but then I had a really interesting workshop with the Young Carers. Uh, and a lot of people in the room never heard of it. I've, I've heard of it for a few years now. There's three of them in every 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 classroom. They're saying is these are these are young people who are dealing who are supporting. Um, they're either a family member who is who is affected by illness, old age, disability, and they're just they're just throughout the and there's little to no support for these the, what these students are going through. And we really need to create some awareness. It's a really fascinating. Uh, it was a fascinating workshop. Um, and you know these these young carers, they they have strengths that we that a lot of our kids probably are envious of the empathy, ability to advocate for themselves and for others, emotional resilience, coping skills. These are all stuff that we want our kids to have. But these kids are these young carers are are, are taking this on um, with uh, you know without consideration. Um, I wasn't sitting into this particular workshop, if I may, but. Mm -hmm. I remember from my time, so when I was active at school council and while my son was in uh, K-12, uh, and now I'm talking mostly during the primary uh, school years. So these were the years when the boards transitioned from faith-based to ling language-based. That's probably the only one time I had more people in the room when we made the switch. Um, but because uh, we were living in Snowden, so if you, you know the Snowden area, so on McDonald there are two schools. So back in the day, St. Antone was Catholic. I don't remember the name of the other, the other one was part Protestant, both were French, so both schools were merging into the one. It's called that, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had, <laughs> we had a, few, uh, a few discussions. But the young carers I would add is that there's an added dimension, and I remember this from my tenure at St. Antone. The school was multilingual, multi-faith, multicultural. Uh, we had done a quick survey. We had the United Nations represented in the student body. And more often than not, the pupils were actually the interpreters on behalf of their parents because the school, the way, uh, uh, the way it's situated on McDonald and in Snowden, the school was, was also open to a large swath of, popu uh, of population from Côte d'Ange. So there were buses that would come in and those parents, when they, we would have parent-teacher conferences, 
those parents would come with the child and the child would be actually speaking and translating for the parents. So I guess that might be one facet it's, of it's this. A, it's definitely a facet of that for sure. Then we moved on to the in, very interesting discussion at lunchtime. I thought that was very interesting by Sebastien Le Belgrenier. A um, couple things stood out. Ang you know, the fact the gov this government thinks that Angles take up too much space in, in, in this province, that's too bad. That really is too bad. I don't think we take up nearly enough space personally. Um, and it's not because we're, we, you know, he said we're not against promoting and protecting the French language. We do it all the time. We, 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 we support it. Um, but they're not going to get anywhere by discrediting the English speaking community. Um, went on to a really interesting Fraser Hickson Institute one, uh, workshop on literacy reintegration for, and reintegration for vulnerable youth. Fraser Hickson, the library I went to as a kid all the time. <laughs> awesome library um, and they had this mini biblio program for early for zero to eight which is really really exciting you know working with families and, and low-income uh, families um, street school we've been you know in discussions with y for y on this and the regroupement des écoles de la rue it's a really interesting option of of you know um, getting kids who have dropped out or they're, actually they're not even kids anymore because the average age is about 25 to 30 but they're they're dropping out. They're they're on the road. They're on the street. They don't you know, and there's this organization. So the, the, so Y for Y is looking at a way to, to bring this to the English speaking community. So they're looking for partners and stuff, and want to work with local school boards, adult centers, and Bach Ed. Um, and then foster intergenerational uh, gardening and intergenerational project with the Eva Marston Center and West Haven Community Center is bringing youth and seniors together, something we do all the time in the CLC network. And it's the, the, the joy on the faces of both the, the, the kids and the adults. Uh, it, you know, there's benefits for everybody. Um, and I guess the town hall, well, hey, that's, that's, that's right down my alley. And, you know, I mean, it all brought back to, you know, you're talking about dealing with the government uh, I have my own issues with dealing with the government with work, but you know, Russ talked this morning. It brought brought me back to thinking about this whole issue of centralization. It's just so heavy-handed, top-down, paternalistic um, that we haven't experienced in 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 all my years of education. I've never seen it this bad, and it just seems to be getting worse. So, um, you know, and I think I think it was Cindy that sort of finished it off. When we do things, we do it really well. We just need to do a better job of getting getting the word out of what this great stuff it is that we do. Uh, that was amazing. Bravo, Debbie and Dominique, the dynamic duo. And with that, on time, on budget, we end day one of uh, a really Celine and Anna, bravo. You pulled it off. Day one was a success. And please come back for day two, and the added bonus is at the end of it, there's a cocktail. Bye, everyone. <laughs>